Chapter 1. The late afternoon glow of the sweltering sun beats down on the city in the waning months of summer, painting the sky with hues of reds and oranges as it dips down towards the horizon. Weaving through the streets below, a young Izuku Midraya sits in the back seat of his mother's car, watching the city pass by in a blur. His mother is speaking, talking to Auntie Mitsuki on the phone. But her voice is muffled, a mere background noise idly brushing his ears. Mothers always talk a lot, and he has far more important things to be paying attention to like deciding whether that clown looks more like All Might or Endeavor. The biased, fanboy side of Izuku wants to say All Might, but the way the light of the sun is hitting the cloud is turning it orange, making it look like Endeavor's, Hell Flame. Izuku is still gazing at the strangely shaped cloud in contemplation when a delightful laugh slices through his thoughts, drawing his attention to the background noise that is no longer muffled. He glances away from the window at Inko. Mothers always talk a lot, but he never minds when Inko talks to Auntie Mitsuki, because Auntie Mitsuki always makes her laugh more than anyone. A part, of him thinks that Andy Mitsuki probably does it because she likes to hear Inko's laugh as much as he does. Sweet and soft, and somehow has a way of making you feel just a little bit happier to be alive, even if you're already having the best day. Izuku's glad that she has a best friend so eager to bring out that beautiful laugh, and it's even better that said friend is the mother of his own, best friend. They're talking about him now. Gossiping as mothers do, about their children right in front of them, as if as you could can't hear. I was just getting a little worried you know? Inko is saying, well, you do know, you know how anxious I get, I she cuts off, and Andy Mitsuki must have made a comment because she lets out a little snort before continuing, anyway, so I took him to the doctor today, just to be sure he, well, would be manifesting a quirk and Dr. Tsubasa reassured me that everything was fine. He took some x-rays of his feet and found that he didn't have an extra joint on his little toe. Apparently that's some indicator of quirklessness. I know right? I didn't even realize people could have a joint there. She laughs, airy and cheerful, and it instantly brings, a smile to Izuku's face. He looks down at his feet and wiggles his toes and signed his shoes before going back to staring out the window. Still, he idly listens to his mother as she continues to talk to Auntie Mitsuki. So he basically told me that his Yuku is just a late bloomer. It's not often kids turn five without manifesting their quirks, so he says that his Yuku will get his any day now. His Yuku can hear a muffled voice from the phone, but despite how loud his best friend's mother is, he can't make out what she is saying. However, a moment later, Inko answers his silent wonderings when she calls back to her son in a light voice, Hey, Izuku, Mitsuki-kun wants to know what quirk you are hoping you'll get. Izuku blinks. Of course, that's something he's thought about a lot. His eyes are drawn, back to the cloud, which he has to admit, is an endeavor cloud. Perhaps the winds high above have shifted, but parts of the cloud are now streaking slightly, making it look even more flame-like in the light of the sun. The Endeavor Cloud stands strong and proud against the crimson sky, but his Yuku feels nothing but apprehension curling in his stomach. A couple of years ago, he might have wanted to be, a fire breather, like his father. It would no doubt be a cool quirk to have, and maybe he could even become a hero with it. He used to watch a bunch of videos about flame heroes like Endeavor since he was so convinced he'd inherit his father's quirk. Now, however. Izuku's not as inclined towards it as before. For as long as he can remember, it's always been him and his mother. His father just, hasn't been in the picture, so Izuku thinks it would be, odd, to get his quirk. It would be like getting a stranger's quirk. Inko always seems a bit sad whenever he asks about him and making his mother sad is the last thing he wants to do, so perhaps it would be better for him to inherit her quirk. It might not be very strong, but that's because Inko never wanted to become a hero. Izuku's sure, that if he got her quirk and he trained it hard it would become strong enough to help him become a great hero like All Might. Turning his gaze away from the fiery cloud, Izuku grins brightly at his mother and chirps, I wanna get mama's quirk. 
Inko smiles in response and it makes his Yuku's heart flutter happily. Did you hear that? She asks Sandy Mitsuki and then laughs at her response. Oh, don't be so dramatic, you know Katsuki kun adores you too. He just doesn't want to look like such a mama's boy. Is Yuku giggles, already having a pretty good idea of what Auntie Mitsuki said about her son, and turns back to the window. He looks away from the clouds and turns his attention to the sky dyed with crimson. Despite the ominous color, he doesn't feel any sort of unease. Instead, he finds himself reminded of a certain red-eyed boy. Can I go hang out with Kaken when we get home? He asks abruptly. Let me ask Mitsuki-kun, dear, Inko replies before doing just so. She must get an enthusiastic response because she lets out another giggle that tickles his Yuku's ears like jingling bells before saying, all right, just give us a few minutes to change and we'll be there soon. The two women bid goodbye and a minute later the Midrians are pulling into their driveway. His Yuku immediately jumps out and starts towards Kaken's house, but Enko is quick to snatch him and shoo him into their own house to get changed. Once the two are ready, Izuku takes his mother's hand and eagerly begins leading the way down the street towards the Bukagis residence. Their neighborhood is small and, has only a handful of kids, including Tsubasa and Inabu, who both live a bit farther from Izuku than Kaken does. But Izuku doesn't mind the small size, and the lack of a large friend group has never bothered him. Why would he ever need anyone other than Kaken? Speaking of, the sky has darkened now. But Izuku finds the same shade from earlier in the pair of eyes that pop out from behind the window as they approach the Bukagis house. Oi, Zuku. Kaken's shout is muffled. Hurry up, slowpoke. Kaken, you little get down from there. Go away, old hag. Kaken disappears from the window and shouting erupts from within the house. Izuku giggles and Inko lets out a fond sigh as they approach the door no doubt stealing herself for a very loud night. She knocks and the door swings, open, revealing Kaken and a very irritated looking Auntie Mitsuki behind him. Her expression smooths out the second she sees Inko and she spreads her arms welcomingly. Inko kun, come in, come in. Hey there, little is you kun. Izuku blushes as she ruffles his hair and Kaken groans in annoyance. The blonde brushes past his mother and grabs him by the arm before beginning to drag him towards his room. Auntie Mistuki scowls at her son as they pass. Oi, dinner's gonna be ready in 20 minutes, you hear? She snaps, don't start making a mess. We won't. Izuku reassures her as he gets pulled along, but Auntie Mitsuki just smiles sweetly at him. Oh, Izuku-kun, you know I don't mean you. She sends a pointed glare at Kaken, who just rolls his eyes. Yeah, yeah, fine. Come on, Zuku. He takes the smaller boy to his room and shuts the door loudly. Turning to him, the blonde demands, Well? Tsubasa-kun said Auntie was taking you to see his grandpa about your quirk. What did he say? Izuku ponders. The doctor visit this afternoon was a bit boring. Dr. Tsubasa said a lot of stuff and spoke more to his mother than to him, but Izuku dutifully recounts the gist of what he understood of the events that transpired, and when he's finished Kaken huffs and folds his arms. Well, what's taking so long? He asks impatiently. Izuku gives a small, clueless shrug. I dunno but he said it's gonna come any day now. I'm excited. He clenches his fists and beams at his friend. I can't wait to be a hero like All Might. Kaken scowls. Nua, I'm gonna be like All Might. He opens his palms, and lets out a couple of explosions as if to prove his point. I'm gonna be the best hero ever. Better than All Might, even. Izuku's eyes widen. Better than All Might? He asks in awe, no way. Yes way. Just you wait. Kaken brushes past his yuku to a basket of toys leaning against his wall. Once I get bigger, I'm gonna beat up all of the villains in the world. No one will beat me. You'll see, his yuku gazes after his friend fondly. Kaken is loud and abrasive, just like his quirk, but he's also the most determined person his yuku knows. 
nothing ever seems to scare him or make his confidence waver. He's just amazing even before his quirk manifested he was always amazing. His quirk just made him even cooler. Not cooler than All Might, though. Kakan, his back still turned to his Yuku, proceeds, to turn the basket over and dump all of his toys on the ground. His Yuku frowns. Erm, Kakan, your mom said not to make a mess, he says uneasily. Kakan scoffs. Who cares what that old hag says? Come on, I wanna play heroes. He takes out an All Might action figure and pushes an Endeavor figure towards his Yuku. Here, you can be my sidekick. A bit disgruntled but used to it by now, the few times, he's insisted on being the main hero Kakan had been irritated the entire time, as Yuku takes the toy and settles down next to him. Kakan quickly starts setting up an narrative, using dramatic voices and his quirk for effects. As they play, their mother's muffled chatting coming from the kitchen, as Yuku thinks back to their earlier discussion. I wonder what quirk I'll get. He ponders aloud, Kakan stops swooping the all, might action figure through the air and gives him a look. I hope I get mama's quirk. Or maybe a mix of hers and dad's, although I don't know if that can happen. Kakan stares at him for a few moments, then turns away with a dismissive snort. Well, no matter what quirk you end up with, you'll never be able to beat me. As soon as he says that, Auntie Mitsuki's voice calls from the kitchen telling them that dinner is ready. Kakan quickly scrambles to his feet and runs out the room. Izuku doesn't follow for a few moments, instead sitting back and listening as the mother and son start snapping at each other. Kakan's words. Leave an odd feeling in his chest. He wouldn't say they hurt, because he knows better than to put so much personal offense behind the boy's words. Kakan is, always rude and often speaks without thinking that's just the way he is and he should be used to it by now. But still. Oi, nerd. Get over here, we're eating sukiyaki. Ignoring the odd ache in his heart, Izuku gets to his feet and dashes over to the kitchen coming. Now that they know with certainty that Izuku will be getting a quirk, all that is left to do is wait. And so they do. Every morning, Izuku wakes up, expecting to feel different, expecting for this to be the day his quirk will manifest. Every morning, he attempts to telekinetically pull objects towards himself or to breathe fire. And every morning, nothing seems to change. Nothing seems. Different. At first, he doesn't worry about it too much. One week since seeing Dr. Tsubasa goes by and life goes on as normal. But, then one week turns into two, then into three, then into a month. By the end of October, just over two months since he turned five, Izuku still has yet to manifest his quirk and he's beginning to get impatient. Kakan is too. Not only that, but he seems to also be getting disappointed. Bored with his Yuku. The greenet can see it in his eyes after each time he asks if his quirk manifested that day, after each time he replies negatively. He can see the disinterest, the way he turns and chooses to spend more and more time with Tsubasa and Inabu both of whom have already manifested their quirks. It leaves an unsettling feeling in his gut. He doesn't understand. Why won't his quirk come? It will come. Won't it? The doctor said it would, but people whisper things around him now. His, teachers give him concerned, pitying glances when they think he's not looking. His classmates are confused and mutter to each other behind his back. Then one day, Inaba says it. Maybe he just doesn't have a quirk. Izuku freezes. He, Kakan, Tsubasa, and Izuku are exploring a nearby forest after school, one they've been to a few times before. The three boys still let Izuku tag along on their adventures, but lately he can tell it's with some reluctance, so he hangs back. Still, despite being a few feet behind the trio, he hears Inaba's suggestion loud and clear. That's stupid. How could he not have a quirk? Kakan snaps, and a part of his Yuku is relieved that his best friend is defending him, despite having disappointed him. But then Tsubasa pipes up. My dad says it's called being quirkless. And that word, that word. The one people have been whispering around him, 
acting like he can't hear. Quirkless. As in, without a quirk? Him? No, it's it's impossible. Sure he's a little later than normal, but the doctor. The doctor. Some people just are just born without them, Tsubasa continues, oblivious to Izuku's inner turmoil, my great aunt doesn't have one I'm gonna have, a quirk. Izuku insists, interrupting him. The three glance over their shoulders at him and he falters. I. I don't have an extra toe joint, he explains hesitantly. Dr. Tsubasa-san said that all quirkless people have an extra toe joint but I don't, so. So I'm just a late bloomer. The trio share dubious glances before Kakan tosses his head and scoffs. Well, then hurry up already, Zuku, we've been waiting forever. Izuku smiles nervously and trots after them as they continue their exploration of the forest. He'll get his quirk. Doctors are smart people, Inko says to listen to them. He just needs to be patient. Soon enough, his presence fades into the background once again as Kakin decides to start showing off his quirk now that there are no adults around. Tsubasa and Inaba encourage him to make bigger explosions, whooping with excitement each time they grow in size. Kakin preens under all the attention, gloating over the power of his quirk as he braces himself for another explosion. Get ready, guys, this one is gonna be the biggest. He hollers, holding his palms out. Izuku smartly decides to take a step back and watches as his friend tenses up before unleashing, an impressive explosion. His awe is short-lived, interrupted by a pained yelp from Kakin. Kakin. He cries out, rushing to the blonde who is clutching his wrists with gritted teeth. Tsubasa and Inaba are closer to him, but somehow Izuku reaches his side first. What happened? He takes Kakin's wrists in his hands and frowns at the sight of slightly burned skin on his wrists and palms. Kakin pushes his discomfort away and glances at Tsubasa and Inaba. Quit worrying, it's nothing, guys. He scoffs dismissively, just happens sometimes when I overuse my quirk. As he talks, Izuku keeps staring down at the boy's injuries. The skin feels hot beneath his fingers, but there's something else to it too. Something strange. Like there's an odd substance? Or perhaps a presence? He isn't quite sure how to name it, but he can feel it lingering right underneath Kakin's skin. Without his awareness, he finds his eyes fluttering shut. As he focuses on that strange heat, he's surprised to discover something similar swirling within him. He doesn't even notice it until he feels it flowing out of him, through his hands and into Kakin's skin. It all happens so quickly and ends, abruptly when Kakin notices Izuku still holding on to him and yanks his wrists out of his hands. Oi, what are you doing, idiot, I said I'm the blonde stops mid-sentence, glancing down at his hands in surprise. His eyes widen. It, it feels better, he murmurs in shock. His head snaps up to Izuku, glaring. What did you do? Izuku is confused until he notices that the burns on Kakin's hands, are completely gone, the skin unmarred. Eh? What happened? Inaba asks, stepping closer to observe Kakin's wrists, Hey, your burns are gone. Yeah, no shit, but how? Kakin snaps, still glaring at Izuku. The other two boys turn to look at him. Did you do this, Midraya-kun? Tsubasa asks tilting his head curiously. Izuku anxiously shifts his feet under the attention and wrings his hands. Um, I I don't know, he squeaks, it term, I don't know, it felt weird. I. I don't know what happened. Inaba blinks and his eyes widen. Hey, maybe this is your quirk? Try it again. Izuku turns to Kakin, who is still glaring, and holds out his hands. Kakin huffs and begrudgingly lets Izuku hold his wrists. Izuku tries to find that strange warm sensation again, but it seems to have vanished, alongside Kakin's burns. He frowns. I don't think I can do it now, he says, the feeling is gone. I don't know how to get it back. Well, what did it feel like? Inaba asks, surprisingly patient, describe what happened. Izuku presses his lips together and tries to find the right words. It was like. Warm? 
Kakin's burns, I mean, but not his skin it was like something underneath his skin, it wasn't like regular warm either erm, I don't know how to describe it, but I could just feel it. Um. Um, and then I felt the same thing in me. Except it was leaving. It was like flowing out of me into Kakin and then his burns were gone. He trails off uncertainly. The feeling was so strange and alien that it kind of scares him, especially not knowing what it is. They all turn when Tsubasa, suddenly spreads his wings. Hold on, I've got an idea, he says before disappearing up into the trees. There's a moment of silence, then the sound of leaves rustling and branches snapping. A bird shrieks, making Izuku flinch, before Tsubasa reappears. Here, he says, landing in front of them. He pushes a small bird into Izuku's hands and says, I broke its wing. See if that weird feeling comes, back. What? Izuku exclaims, Tsubasa-kun, that's so mean. Poor bird. Tsubasa rolls his eyes but Izuku doesn't notice, too busy focusing on the bird in his palms that is frozen in fear. As soon as his fingers brush over the bird's wing, he feels the strange warmth again. This time, though, he can feel it swirling around the bird's wing joint. The word dislocated comes to mind he sees it, happening to hero's arm sometimes in movies. Closing his eyes, he tries to summon the warmth within him that he felt earlier, only to discover that it's already flowing out of him. Now that it's not as shocking anymore, he takes the time to really focus on the feeling and try to decipher what it is. Ow! He yelps, dropping the bird. It unfurls its wings and takes flight, fleeing back up into the trees. He frowns down at his finger where the bird pecked him, but there's no blood. Hey, it worked. Inaba exclaims, you healed it. You have a healing quirk. Cool. Tsubasa grins. What? Kakin barks, scowling, that's not possible, his parents don't have healing quirks. Inaba shrugs cluelessly. I don't know, man. Maybe it skipped a generation or two. That's really cool, though. Midraya kun Tsubasa says, I've never seen one like that before. How does it work? What does it feel like? Taken aback by the sudden positive attention, Izuku flounders for a moment. Uh. Uh, erm, it felt like. He racks his brain, trying to find the right word to describe the feeling. It felt like. Energy. Yeah, like energy or something. It's like I pushed my energy into the injury and it, got better. Oh, oh, and I could also kind of tell what the, injury was? Like. Like I could feel Kakin's energy swirling around his burns and the birds around its wing, but with the bird I could tell that its wing wasn't broken but dislocated. Cause, um. It was like the energy was more focused around the joint? Like it was trying to fix it. It sounds confusing even to him, and one look at his friend's faces tells him they think so too. But his, confusion is being pushed aside by his excitement. This is his quirk. He finally got his quirk. Oh my gosh, I have a quirk now. He exclaims, jumping up and down, I have a quirk, I have a quirk. In a laughs, well, come on. Let's see if you can heal more stuff. With a mischievous grin. He reels his fist back and punches Tsubasa's shoulder. Ow. Jerk. Tsubasa growls. Before he can on, Inba, however, Izuku latches onto his arm and wow, he doesn't even have to try to use his quirk, it just activates automatically as soon as he feels an injury. Whoa. Tsubasa breathes, flexing his arm, the pain went away so fast. Thanks, Midraya-kun. The praise has Izuku's heart fluttering and he can't help the grin that breaks out on his face. Hey, I wanna try. Inaba whines, punch me, punch me. Hey. Kakin says, but he gets ignored. Tsubasa snickers and is more than happy to sock Inaba in the arm. The boy hisses but soon smiles when Izuku eagerly uses his quirk on him. Man, you're so lucky. Inaba says, that's gonna be such a useful quirk. Hey, Kakin repeats. Let's go see what else you can heal, Tsubasa says. Hey, idiots. Kakin finally snaps, we're not doing, that. 
Tsubasa and Inaba turn to him and whine but he merely snarls back at them. I'm taking Zuko back to Auntie. This is weird shit and we've got to figure out what's going on before he gets hurt. Eh? Hurt? How would he get hurt? Inaba tilts his head. Kakan gives him a are you stupid? Look. All quirks have drawbacks, especially when they're overused, he says, flexing his wrists. Inaba, opens his mouth to argue, then closes it and frowns thoughtfully. Izuku's a bit disappointed he just got his quirk and now Kakan wants him to stop using it question mark but then notices something. He's a bit tired, not terribly so, but more than he usually is at this time of the day. Perhaps the whole energy transfer thing drains his own energy? I I guess I am feeling a bit tired, he admits. Kakan, arches his brow and Inaba as if to say see? And the other boy just rolls his eyes. Oh, fine. We'll play with it more tomorrow, Inaba says. Yeah, you gotta show the class. Tsubasa says. Izuku smiles. I can't wait. Kakan decides that it's time to go and grabs him by the arm, dragging him back towards the street. Thanks for helping me figure out my quirk, guys. He calls back. Yeah, no, problem. Congrats. Still beaming. Izuku turns back around and lets himself be dragged by Kakan. He still can't believe this is happening. He's never been so confused and happy in his life. Isn't this great, Kakan? He says, I finally have a quirk. Kakan doesn't look at him as he replies, yeah. Great. His tone is low and he doesn't sound too happy. Izuku's enthusiasm wanes. What's wrong? He asks, confused. Nothing. Kakin retorts, let's just get you to Andy. She'll figure out what's going on. Izuku pouts. Thankfully, the walk back home is short so soon he's swinging the front door open and crying out, Mama, Mama. I got Mike work. What? Inko exclaims, rushing over from the kitchen, oh, sweetie, that's wonderful. She scoops Izuku up and presses numerous kisses onto his cheeks. He whines and tries to squirm away. Kakin fidgets impatiently by the door. Oh, my baby, I'm so happy for you. Finally managing to push her face away, Izuku says, and you'll never guess what it is. Oh? Inko asks, feigning confusion, what is it? Healing, Kakin interrupts. She turns to the blonde in surprise and he stares back up at her sullenly. It's some sort of healing quirk. Huh? Now Inko's confusion is real. Izuku nudges her repeatedly and whines, Mama, you never told me we had healing quirks in our family. Inko is still glancing between the two boys, her mind clearly whirling. We don't, she says softly, his brow furrowing, Honey, are you sure? Yeah. Izuku says enthusiastically. Inko blinks and glances at Kakan, who is gazing at her with, an unusually serious expression. Katsuki-kun? She questions with an uncertain tone. Sensing her hesitance, Kakan huffs and stomps into the kitchen. He pulls out a small knife from the drawer, alarming Inko, but before she can stop him he purposefully slices the edge of his palm. Katsuki-kun! What on earth are you doing? Zuku, Kakan says, holding his palm up to the smaller boy who is squirming out of his mother's grasp, show her. Izuku takes Kakan's hand in his and his quirk immediately flows. Now hold on, you can't just tow. Inko's eyes widen comically as the cut vanishes within seconds. For a few moments she just stares, even when Izuku beams up at her proudly. See? She blinks slowly, a soft toy escaping her lips. Uh. Um. Oh okay. She speaks haltingly as if she's, still trying to wrap her brain around the situation. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's. Let's. She straightens up and looks down at Izuku, plastering on a nervous smile. Why don't we visit Dr. Tsubasa again, honey, okay? Okay. Izuku agrees cheerfully, bouncing from foot to foot. Kakin is still frowning. Kakin kun, why don't you head home? And. And maybe have your mother check out your hand? But, his hand's fine, see? 
is Yuku says, I healed it. I know, honey, but just in case, Inko says, quickly grabbing her purse and keys and herding the kids to the door. Come on, then. Izuku bids Kakan goodbye and Inko watches the boy until he has disappeared down the street before she puts her son into the car and drives off. Dr. Tsubasa looks stunned when Inko tells him about Izuku's strange, new quirk, but he doesn't look disbelieving. Instead, he calmly retrieves a scalpel and scrapes off a small amount of skin on his wrist before asking Izuku to demonstrate his ability. The boy happily obliges and the doctor watches with fascination as his own skin heals right before his eyes. Well. He huffs good-naturedly, that's a healing quirk alright. Inko's eyes widen as Izuku squeals in, excitement. Really? He asks, eyes sparkling. Yes, and a pretty powerful one if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Tsubasa replies, much to the delight of the young boy. A healing quirk. He really has a healing quirk. And a powerful one. But Tsubasa-san, Inko says, smiling hesitantly at her son's happiness, I don't understand. No one in my family or my husband's family has a healing quirk, at least, none that we knew of. And I wouldn't expect them to, Dr. Tsubasa explains, notably looking at both Inko and Izuku as he does so as opposed to only the former like he did during their earlier visit. You see, healing quirks are exceptionally rare and one of the reasons for that is because they're not hereditary, meaning that they aren't passed down through genetics. Only a small amount of, quirks spontaneously manifest in people without a prior genetic inclination for that quirk, and an even smaller amount of that small amount are healing quirks. He smiles at Inko. Your son has something truly special here, Midraya-san. Inko inhales sharply and smiles again this time more warmly. Oh, she breathes, tucking her son closer to her side, that's good then. Very good, the doctor, says, in all my years as a medical professional, I've never seen a quirk like his before. Healing quirks usually work by manipulating some aspect of the patient's body to help them heal faster. I'm sure you've heard of the youthful heroin recovery girl. Both Inko and Izuku nod, the latter more vigorously. Well, her quirk speeds up a person's natural healing ability by drawing from their stamina. An old colleague of mine could manipulate blood, which was helpful in stopping bleeding. I've also heard of a handful of people with pain stopping quirks. But this energy transfer that your son has described. Well, I've never seen anything like it. And the speed that his quirk healed at. He laughs incredulously and shakes his head. It's truly amazing. I'm envious even. Most doctors. And nurses either have diagnosis like quirks or more minor healing quirks. People with stronger healing quirks are so rare they're usually snatched up by hero agencies as soon as possible. Izuku gasps at the words hero agencies and clutches his mother's arm excitedly. Inko brushes her hand through his hair but her smile wavers slightly. So. Izuku's quirk, she starts, everything's alright. Then? It, it's so unfamiliar and rare that I can't help but worry. Oh, yes, of course, Dr. Tsubasa says, all quirks have drawbacks, as I'm sure you know. From what Izuku has told me and from what I've seen, it seems like his quirk relies on him passing his own energy to someone else. He mentioned being tired after using it a lot, so I assume that limited amount of energy to give and if he overuses his quirk he'll exhaust himself. So he turns to fix Izuku with a kind but firm look, let's not use your quirk to heal every single scrape and bruise your friends might get, okay? Izuku smiles and nods. Okay. Good. Dr. Tsubasa nods and pats his head. Well, aside from that, you should have no worries. He smiles when he says that, but for some reason his smile seems to falter, after a moment. Izuku doesn't notice already getting up as the doctor's tone of voice suggests the appointment is about to finish, but Enko notices it immediately. She stands up when the doctor does and begins walking with her son to the door. Before she leaves, however, Dr. Tsubasa stops her with his arm. He hesitates, then smiles down at his Yuku. Hey, Midraya-kun, why don't you play with the 
toys in the waiting room for a little bit? He, suggests, his voice light, I just need to talk to your mother about some paperwork for a few minutes. Izuku simply shrugs. Okay. They wait for him to leave, then shut the door behind him. He skips down the hall into the waiting room, humming in contemplation. Dr. Tsubasa said a lot of things with a lot of big words, but Izuku thinks he understood most of it. Excitement bubbles in his chest, his quirk is super rare and he can help people with it. Can this day get any better? When he re-enters the waiting room, he spies a basket of toys in the far corner. There are already a couple of kids playing, but he figures he can join them. Before he might have hesitated, but he has a quirk now why should he? The two kids smile at him and let him join their game, and when the topic of quirks, inevitably comes up he cheerfully proclaims that he has a healing quirk. Their eyes widen and they ooh and ah, causing pride to fill his chest. Having a quirk to be proud of is something new and amazing for him. God, he's so happy his quirk manifested. They play for a few minutes while talking about their powers Okikun can make plants grow when she spits on dirt and Yamabekun can turn hard objects soft. Then they both get called in for their appointments and Izuku is only alone for a minute before his mother returns. He beams at her. But for some reason she looks troubled. Mama? He questions, but she merely plasters on a fake smile and tells him that it's time to go. The anxious look on her face doesn't disappear on the drive home and when he tries to distract her with conversation her replies are short and tense. Izuku doesn't understand. The doctor just told them great news and his quirk is even better than he expected why isn't she happy? She also takes them straight to Kakin's house instead of their own home. Uncle Masaru is surprised when he answers the door but welcomes them in any ways. Zuku. Kakin shouts as a greeting. He stomps over and demands. What did the doctor say? Auntie Mitsuki ruffles her son's hair and ignores his indignant squawking. The little brat told us what happened today. She props her hand on her hip. So is it true? Does Izuku have a healing quirk? Why yeah. Apparently, Inko replies, rubbing the back of her neck. It's super rare but healing quirks just manifest spontaneously, so they're not passed down from the parents. Izuku can kind of pass his energy to other people? And I guess that heals them. Wow, Auntie Mitsuki says flashing a grin at Izuku, nice one, kiddo. Yeah, Uncle Masaru agrees, but then trails off when he looks at Inko. He must see something in her expression because he turns to the two young boys and says, hey, how about you guys go play in Godsuki's room? Izuku looks up, oh, okay. Kakin scoffs and starts pulling him towards his room, but instead of going inside he stops at the end of the hallway. Turning to Izuku, he presses a finger to his lips and crouches down. Kakin? Izuku whispers, what are we doing? SHH. Kakin hisses back, idiot. They sent us away because they want to talk about stuff behind our backs. Izuku blinks and then tilts his head in, confusion. Then. Shouldn't we leave? Kakin scowls and covers the other boy's mouth with his hand leaning closer to the entrance of the hallway so he can hear better. Inko-kun? Uncle Masaru asks quietly, is everything okay? There's a few moments of silence, then a soft sniffle. Inko-kun. Auntie Mitsuki cries out a little too loudly, causing her husband to shush her, what's wrong, nothing, nothing. Inko replies hastily, but her voice breaks, I mean, nothing's wrong with Izuku. I. I'm happy for him, really. It's just. Her voice trails off and she sniffles a couple more times, trying not to hiccup. Hearing his mother struggle not to cry makes Izuku want to go out and comfort her, but Kakin holds him still. Uncle Masaru's voice speaks up, why don't we sit down and you, can tell us what happened? Inka must nod because there's the sound of footsteps and then chairs scraping against the floor. Izuku hears his mother inhale shakily before beginning to speak. It's just. Something the doctor wanted to warn me about before we left. I don't mean to scare you with what I'm about to tell you, Midraya-san, 
Dr. Tsubasa says as he closes the door behind him, but, considering the situation, I just feel I have to give you a heads up. Please, take a seat. Inko does, and the doctor sits in a stool across from her. Clasping his hands in front of him, he says, I just need to emphasize how rare your son's quirk is, and how powerful it could potentially become. He's only five years old and yet he was able to completely heal a dislocated bird's wing. I have no doubt his quirk will only strengthen with age, but he trails off for a moment, then asks, how much do you know about recovery girl? Inko blinks in surprise, then admits, not much really. I just know she works at a Dr. Tsubasa nods. She is also considered to have one of the most powerful healing quirks in Japan, if not the most powerful. She doesn't do this as often anymore, but she used to travel all across Japan and sometimes the world to heal people with her quirk. She's also the only reason I can train their students the way they do without her I'm sure the school would have to face numerous lawsuits from parents whose children come home from school injured every day. And since healing quirks are so rare, hero agencies never seem to have enough healers and they often travel between agencies to help out where they are needed. He pauses, opens his mouth, then closes it. Finally, he settles on, basically what I'm trying to say is, his Yuko will be highly sought after once people become more aware of his quirk. Oh. Inko says, that's. That's wonderful. His Yuko has always loved heroes he wants to be one too, although I suppose with his new quirk things might happen a bit differently. But I'm sure he'd be thrilled to work with them. She smiles, but it fades away quickly at the look on the doctor's face. What is it? It's just. He sighs then meets her gaze head on and says, healers are not only sought after by heroes. It's not unheard of for villains to seek out healers and try to kidnap them, especially organized crime groups. See, they can't go to the hospital if they get hurt in a fight, so healers are valuable to them too. Hero agencies usually keep their healers close and protected at all costs, especially in the most recent decade, but, well, I'm sure you heard of the incident with the healer at Endeavor's agency, yes? Huh? No, I haven't, Inko replies, clutching her purse anxiously. Oh, well I suppose it's been a while. Probably, only a couple of years before Izuka was born, actually. Well, there was a bit of drama going on with Endeavor's hero agency because his healer was stolen by villains. Endeavor managed to rescue him a couple of days later, of course but it was quite the scandal. People criticized Endeavor rather harshly, but it ended up with hero agencies significantly increasing the protection around their healers, so overall there was a good outcome. Inko nods and looks down at her shoes, biting her lip as her anxiety rises. Dr. Tsubasa notices and places his hand over hers. I'm sorry, I really don't mean to scare you with this, I just need you to be aware, he says soothingly. His Yuku's quirk is wonderful, but you just need to keep a close eye on him. Right now he's at his most vulnerable, because he's young and cannot defend himself. Maybe just make sure he always has a friend with him when he walks home from school. At this point, Inko is fighting off tears. Oh, God, she hiccups, I don't I don't know, I I never thought about this I never even considered. She sniffles and lets out a wavering sigh. Izuku loves heroes and I'm sure he'll want to use his quirk to help them. But. Should I not let him? Should I just know? No actually, Dr. Tsubasa interrupts, his love for heroes is a good thing. If he wants to become a hero healer then he absolutely should. But you just said his quirk will get attention no matter where he goes, he says, but if he ends up working with heroes then he'll have their protection. That's why I said most doctors and nurses have minor healing quirks because people with powerful ones often catch the attention of heroes, who will in turn protect them from many villains who also have their eye on them. Oh. Okay, Inko says, nodding rapidly. She takes a deep breath and nods once more, her mind racing. Okay. This. This is a lot, but. She exhales sharply and laughs shakily, hey and I was worried he'd breathe fire. The 
Dr. chuckles sympathetically before sobering up. He pats her hand and smiles at her reassuringly. Don't ever forget is Yuku's quirk is a good thing. He just needs to be a bit more careful than most children. Inko sniffles and wipes her watery eyes. Uncle Maseru hands her a tissue that she gratefully accepts and dries off her tears. Wow, Auntie Mitsuki says, her voice unusually soft, long day, huh? Inko lets out a wet laugh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I probably look like such a mess, she apologizes profusely, it's just. The thought of some villain snatching up my poor baby. Hey, hey, that's not gonna happen, Auntie Mitsuki reassures, we're not gonna let that happen. I'll make sure our little brat stays by his side at all times. Huh? Inko says, oh, no, I don't want to, impose nonsense. Auntie Mitsuki insists, they're already best friends, it wouldn't be any trouble. And perhaps, Uncle Masaru suggests, when is Yukuna's a bit older he can take some self-defense classes. Oh. Inko perks up a bit. That's that's a good idea. Maybe he. As the parents continue to discuss things quietly, Izuku and Kakan listen from the hallway. Izuku is struggling to understand what's going on. His mother sounded so sad that he kept wanting to run to her side and comfort her, but Kakan kept grabbing him and holding him back. They tried to keep their tussing as quiet as possible, but Izuku still missed some of what was said. He kept hearing the words healer, Izuku's quirk, danger, and heroes, and combining that with what little else he heard, his mind comes to the realization that he's been wondering about ever, since his quirk manifested. I can become a hero. He says to Kakan excitedly. Unfortunately, he also said it a bit too loudly and conversation in the other room stops. SHH. Kakan hisses, but it's too late. Boys. Auntie Mitsuki barks, come out here. Glaring at his Yuku, Kakan huffs and begrudgingly walks out of the hallway. The smaller boy on his heels. Auntie Mitsuki frowns at them as, they approach the table where the adults are sitting. You shouldn't eavesdrop, she scolds. Sorry, ma'am, Izuku begins to say, only to be interrupted by Kakan. What's going on here? He snaps, why would someone want to take Zuku? His quirk isn't that cool. What? Yeah it is. Izuku protests, but shrinks away when his friend glares at him. I. I can be a hero with it. Kakan snorts, what, no way. You're just gonna become a doctor or some shit. Oi. Don't say shit like that, brat. Auntie Mitsuki snaps but her son merely rolls his eyes. Dismayed, Izuku glances from Kakan to the adults and cries, but I don't wanna be a doctor, I wanna be a hero. And you can be a hero, Inko says, causing Izuku to beam, well, sort of. I was just talking about it with Dr. Tsubasa-san. You can. Be a hero healer. The children share the same confused expression and both tilt their heads nearly simultaneously. A what? Ha? Huh? A hero healer, Uncle Masaru explains, all hero agencies have them. They're people with really good healing quirks that heal heroes when they get hurt while fighting villains. Oh. Izuku blinks thoughtfully. He'd never really thought about something like that, before. Of course heroes need healers. It makes sense that they would. They don't just magically get better after all. But him? A healer? He isn't sure. Kakan sniffs and tosses his head. Well, when I'm a hero I won't need one. He says braggingly, I'll be so strong I'll never get hurt. He flashes his quirk to prove his point, but shrieks furiously when Andy Mitsuki gives him a little slap, on the back of the head. Of course you're gonna get hurt, you little shit. She snaps, all heroes get hurt one way or another. Didn't you just say Izuku healed you when you overused your quirk? Kakan grumbles angrily and looks like he wants to argue back, but Uncle Masaru eases the tension by saying, even All Might's agency has healers. Kakan and Izuku perk up at this, so the man smiles, and adds, every hero needs a healer and, according to Dr. Tsubasa, they're apparently in high demand. Yeah, so you better keep little as you come close or another hero will snatch him up. 
Anti Mitsuki teases. Kakin's eyes widen and dart from his mother to his friend before they narrow. What the hell? No way. He growls, if you're gonna be anyone's healer, you're gonna be mine. He grabs, onto his Yuku's arm and the smaller boy giggles. Everyone has been looking at him with bright and hopeful eyes ever since he manifested his quirk just a few hours ago. Tsubasa and Inaba were actually pretty nice to him usually they either ignore him or tease him as they follow Kakin around. And Dr. Tsubasa. He seemed really impressed with his quirk. And Andy Mitsuki, Uncle Masaru, and Inko, are all really enthusiastic about this whole healer thing, but. But. But I won't really be a hero, will I? He asks. His voice downtrodden. The adults turn to him in surprise. I. I thought maybe if I got Mama or Papa's quirk I could, but. He looks down at his hands. He can still remember the feeling of his energy being passed to the bird's wing. He clenches them. Looking up at his mother, he struggles to keep the tears out of his eyes as he says, I can't beat up villains with a quirk like this. I can't protect people, so. So how could I really be a hero? Kakan is gazing at him with an odd expression, like he can't quite decide how he feels about the situation. Izuku sniffles and rubs his nose with the back of his hand as Anti Mitsuki kneels down in front of him. Hey, healers, are important too, you know. She says, knocking his forehead lightly with her knuckle, don't dismiss yourself so easily. Yeah, it's a bit of a change of plans for you, but that doesn't mean you can't still be a hero. Hell, you're literally gonna be the hero of heroes. So chin up, kiddo. Izuku blinks at her with wide eyes. The hero of heroes? That. Does sound kind of cool. And, Inko says. Joining Auntie Mitsuki, you won't be giving your poor mother anxiety about you putting herself in danger every day. Auntie Mitsuki barks out a laugh and Uncle Masaru smiles. Then why'd you sound so upset? Kakan asks, bringing attention back to him. We heard Auntie crying. The three adults share glances between them, obviously silently communicating. It clearly frustrates Kakan, but soon, his father sighs softly and explains. We're just worried about people. Taking advantage of Izyakun, he says, do you know what that means? Izuku frowns. Um. I heard Auntie say that bad people wanna take Zuku. Kakan declares. Auntie Mitsuki huffs grumbling something about eavesdropping under her breath. Uncle Masaru puts a hand on her shoulder, but the next moment she straightens up and, fixes Kakan with a hard look. Well, you won't let that happen, now will you? She snaps. Kakan scowls. Huh? If some fucker comes along and decides to snatch Izyakun because he wants to force him to use his quirk, what are you gonna do? Auntie Mitsuki asks. Uncle Masaru tries to warn her not to be so blatant about it so to not scare the kids, but her fiery question gets the reaction she wanted I'll beat him up, of course. Kakan jumps up, flaring his quirk, I'll beat up any fucker who tries to take him. That's right. Andy Mitsuki nods approvingly, then roughly ruffles her son's hair. Kakan grumpily shoves her hand away and scoffs, PSHH. That's what you were so worried about? His gaze lands on Inko, who is looking at him with watery eyes and a smile, and he blushes, he glances away with a huff and grabs onto his Yuku's arm again. Yeah, I'll keep him safe, he grunts, feigning nonchalance. The adults seem pleased, but his Yuku tilts his head in thought. I would have healed them if they asked, he says innocently. Inko shakes her head and takes his hands into hers. No. No, baby, I'm sorry, but you can't just use your quirk on anyone who asks you to, especially not, strangers. There are some bad people out there that might want to take you so they can use your quirk. Izuku doesn't look like he quite understands but wouldn't they not take him if he just heals them question mark but Kakan scowls and bares his teeth. His grip on Izuku's arm tightens. I won't let that happen. Good. Andy Mitsuki gives a single, satisfied nod. Thank you, Godsuki-kun, Inko says, much more gently. She smiles at him and lightly scratches his hair, 
But he doesn't push her hand away. Instead, he merely blushes and averts his gaze, pulling Izuku back towards his room. Come on, Zuku, let's go play video games or something, he grumbles, you're staying for dinner, right? Inko startles, suddenly noticing how late it is, and jumps to her feet. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I didn't, mean to stay so long, I don't mean to impose, I anti Mitsuki laughs and wraps an arm around her shoulders. Oh, shut up. You know you're always welcome. Oh, well at least let me help with dinner. Nope. You're gonna sit down and drink a big glass of wine and get this tension out of your shoulders. As Inko continues to babble, Uncle Masara follows the two women into the kitchen, shaking his head with a soft smile on his face. Kakin rolls his eyes and pushes as Yuku into his room. Ugh, grown-ups. Katsuki isn't really sure how to feel about all this. Zuku's new quirk is weird. It's weird it manifested so late, it's weird that it's so different from his parents' quirks, and it's weird that it's a healing quirk of all things. Katsuki doesn't like surprises, and he most certainly did, not appreciate this one either. He thought Zuku would get one of his parents' quirks like everyone else he thought he'd manifest his mother's weak-ass telekinetic quirk or maybe his father's fire-breathing quirk. Something weak compared to his explosion quirk, but something that could at least provide some entertainment for them. Playing with a healing quirk might be a bit hard though, and it doesn't seem like it'd be very fun anyway. The grown-ups are being so weird about Zuku's quirk too, making it seem like it's so special and that annoys Katsuki but it seems to scare Auntie Inko. Even as a five-year-old, Katsuki could see the genuine fear in her eyes as she told her son why he couldn't use his quirk on strangers. Katsuki likes Auntie Inko. She's pretty and kind, all smooth curves, and round softness, so different from his own mother's roughness and harsh edges. Her hugs are the only ones that Katsuki never pushes away because they feel like being wrapped in a warm blanket fresh from the laundry, and she has doe-like eyes that crinkle when she smiles. Zuko has those eyes too, along with all of his mother's softness. He's timid and gentle and cries easily and so unlike, Katsuki in so many ways but maybe that's what makes him the best playmate, not that he would ever admit it. He's always the first one to run up to a dog in the street and pet it, and he's always the first to run away from something fun and dangerous instead of towards it. He's small and weak and so Katsuki supposes, if he thinks about it, that perhaps this new quirk is actually quite fitting for, him then. It's not flashy or, strong, and neither is he. Honestly, Katsuki can't even imagine someone as meek as Zuko with anything better than some lame healing quirk. Figures he'd need someone as strong as Katsuki to keep him safe. It makes sense. A feeling of importance fills Katsuki's chest and his gaze roams over Zuku as the smaller boy kneels beside their hero toys scattered on the ground. Even though Zuku's nuke work isn't nearly as cool as his, Katsuki can at least see its usefulness. Overusing his quirk always makes his wrists ache terribly, but Zuku made the pain go away almost as soon as he touched him. And even though he still stands by what he said earlier he'll be so strong. He'll never get hurt he sure as hell isn't going to let some other hero snatch up Zuku. His mother said that every hero needs a healer, and Katsuki was Zuku's friend first, so Zuku is his healer. He'll beat up any one hero or bad guy that tries to take him for his quirk. Kakin, are we going to play? Zuko turns and asks, blinking at him with his large, innocent eyes. Katsuki jerks out of his thoughts. Of course we are, nerd. He snaps roughly, making Zuku startle. He steps over to him. Maybe this won't be such a bad thing, Zuku's nuke work. Being Zuku's protector. It'll make Auntie Inko happy, he'll get to have Zuku as his. Chapter 2 The next day at school, Izuku does something he's wanted to do for ages, he shows off his quirk. Tsubasa and Inaba are more than willing to help. Tsubasa somehow got a scrape on his knee after Kakin and Izuku left yesterday, so he bounces up to Izuku as soon as he arrives at school and shows him. If Izuku didn't know any better, he'd say the winged boy almost seemed proud of his scrape. So, 
once they've gathered the attention of all of their classmates and a couple of their teachers, is Yuku reaches out to heal his scrape. He's nervous at first, almost worried that the previous day had been a dream and he didn't really have a quirk, but like before his quirk seems to activate the second he touches the injury. His peers watch with all filled eyes as it fades away into, unblemished skin within seconds. Wow! One girl exclaims, that's so cool, Midraya-kun. Definitely worth the wait. Another laughs. Oh, geez, what a godsend that Gork is. One of the teachers whines good-naturedly, these kids are always roughhousing and getting hurt. Is Yuku beams at the praise. Next to him, Kakin puffs up his chest with pride. And guess what? He declares, when I'm a hero, Zuku's gonna be my healer. More ooing and ooing from the crowd of children. One of the teachers looks amused. A hero healer, huh? She says, well, you've certainly got the quirk for it. How did you say it works again? Izuku explains his theory of energy transfer and she hums contemplatively, I've never heard of a quirk like this before. And I bet it will only get stronger as you, get older. She winks and pats his curls. It's always good to see young people with healing quirks. Lord knows there's not enough of them. Dr. Tsubasa-san said it's cause healing quirks aren't here a heredium, heard hereditary? His teacher asks and he nods. The other teacher raises his eyebrows. Really? I didn't know that. Izuku opens his mouth to say more, but Kakin drags him back, to the group of kids before he can. They swarm around him, asking him questions about his quirk and how it feels and why it was so late. Izuku answers as best as he can but soon Kakin starts to fidget impatiently beside him. After a few more minutes, he clearly gets bored that the attention isn't on him and shoes the other kids away. Izuku doesn't mind too much, though. All of this attention is new and overwhelming he's used to just fading into the background and staying by Kakin's side. Thankfully, the rest of the school day goes by fairly normally, aside from a couple of kids coming up to him during lunch asking him to heal their scrapes and bruises. Then he briefly gains another small audience while he uses his quirk. He doesn't really know how to respond to praise other than, awkwardly smiling and scratching the back of his head, so he doesn't linger very long and the group usually disperses soon after. Kakin can't seem to decide whether he wants to boast about having Izuku as his healer or be grumpy that the attention isn't on him anymore. Inaba tries to reassure him. Don't worry, it's just cause it's a nuke work. I'm sure the hype will die down after a couple of days. Kakin merely grumbles inaudibly but Izuku lets out a sigh of relief. I hope so. He says exasperatedly, I don't know if I like all this attention. I feel so awkward. Kakin snorts but seems appeased by his response. At the end of the day, the four of them walk home together, Tsubasa and Inaba splitting off a couple of streets before theirs. Kakin insists on walking Izuku to his door, which is a bit strange and unnecessary, but Izuku doesn't protest much. When his mother comes back from home soon after, she seems extremely relieved when she sees him but her expression smooths out a moment later and she announces she's making katsudon for dinner. The prospect of his favorite dish erases immediately takes Izuku's mind off of any oddities he may have perceived, and he, later chatters happily to his mother about his first day at school with a quirk as they eat dinner. Before going to bed, he decides to take out a new notebook and start researching everything he can about hero healers. Just like with his hero notebooks, he begins filling pages with information about individual healers, although he quickly discovers that there's a lot more information about Recovery Girl available than there is for any other healer. His eyes roam over article after article about the healer traveling to other countries to heal people, to heal heroes, to save people that others couldn't save in ways that no one else could. By the time Inko peeks into his room, Izuku is fast asleep in front of his computer with Recovery Girl's biography displayed on the monitor screen, she ends up carrying him to bed, and from that night on, Izuku's admiration for Recovery Girl only continues to grow. The second day of school goes just about the same as the first, but the third day is a bit more interesting. It seems that word has spread all over the school about Izuku's quirk. 
he finds himself being approached not only by classmates but by upperclassmen too, asking him to heal, paper cuts and bruises and even a twisted ankle. Izuku happily obliges, but as the weeks go by more and more students approach him with their injuries. He never realized how many scrapes and bruises children got until he was faced with them. They're usually the same students too, ones that like to roughhouse or play sports. Kakin's mood steadily sours as the number of kids to approach Izuku, rises. He tries to tell the students to suck it up, especially with those with smaller injuries, but Izuku can't find it within himself to turn someone away when they're asking for help. This results in him sometimes going home extremely tired from using his quirk so much. Kakin always yells at him when this happens, but Izuku takes it as a learning opportunity. His quirk is called healing, energy that's what they decide when Inko takes him to get it registered. The next day he asks his mother for a new notebook and begins filling it with notes about his own quirk, rather than those of heroes. At school there are plenty of opportunities for him to practice with his quirk, so he learns a few things as time passes. The first thing he discovers is that his quirk doesn't work at all if he's injured or sick. A week after his quirk manifests, he accidentally trips down the stairs and twists his ankle. He doesn't think too much of it until he discovers that he can't use his quirk when someone asks him to at lunch. He panics, wondering what happened, and it only clicks in his mind the day after when his ankle is feeling better that it probably had something to do with that. To test, this, he has Tsubasa punch him in the arm, much to Kakin's displeasure, and tries to heal a scrape, to no avail. So there's that. The second thing he discovers is that skin to skin contact is needed to heal. This, he does not discover by accident but because he is genuinely curious. He supposes it should have been a bit obvious. The third thing he learns about his quirk is that it works best, when he's well fed and well rested. This kind of relates to the whole it won't work if he's injured or sick, except it's just something he notices over time. Like if he doesn't sleep so well the previous night or skips breakfast before school then his quirk is more sluggish and he tires out a lot faster. The fourth thing he discovers is that he cannot do anything to help illnesses. He tries, futilely to pour his energy into Tsubasa when the winged boy gets a cold during the winter to no avail. Kakin eventually drags him away to prevent him from getting sick. The fifth thing he learns is that when he heals someone, he brings them to their absolute best. He discovers this with Kakin one day during winter break. They're off in the forest again, just the two of them this time, and, Kakin is trying to push the outer limits of his quirk and make bigger explosions. Whenever he overuses his quirk, Izuku heals him and he seems to be extra energized afterwards making even bigger explosions than before. Izuku wonders if he has an effect on other people's quirks, but he figures that if he brings them to their full health then it's only natural that their quirks would be working, at their best. He can also sort of sense injuries too, which he knew about with the bird's dislocated wing, but it's especially helpful during the first few weeks after his quirk manifests. Kakin isn't too good at asking for help, even when he knows Izuku can provide it. So sometimes he'll lean against his friend's side and feel with his quirk if he has any injuries, and with a rowdy boy like, Kakin there's almost always some sort of injury. But Kakin doesn't like to bring it up, so Izuku will just grab his hand as they walk home and let his energy flow. Kakin never comments on the sudden energy he feels and instead ruffles Izuku's curls into a rat's nest, much to the greenet's displeasure. Just when he thinks he's learned all he can about his quirk, he discovers something new, it's exciting and quickly comes to love his new power, scribbling down everything he learns into his quirk notebook. He doesn't even mind too much when he goes home tired from healing because it's evidence of his hard work. Inko, however, does mind. Please, Izuku, you need to learn how to say no, she says one night during dinner, I know you want to help everyone, but it's not good for you to be, draining yourself so often. You need energy too. Izuku shoves some rice into his mouth, he always seems to be hungry after a long day of healing, and protests, but it's good quirk practice. Besides, Kakin always uses his quirk. Like, every day. Izuku, Inko says with a firm tone, so Izuku sighs in defeat. 
Okay, okay. The next day after school, Izuku is waiting just outside the main, building, watching kids as they walk home or get picked up, by their parents. Kakin got detention for getting in a fight with another student, which isn't uncommon even though Izuku has made his disapproval very clear, so he has to wait for him to be done. Kakin had insisted that he wait for him, even though Tsubasa and Inaba offered to walk him home, but whatever. He should be done soon. Oi, Midraya kun The boy glances up to see a couple of fourth, graders approaching him. He recognizes them Akumine and Furuya. They treat Izuku well enough, but from what he's heard they're a couple of troublemakers. They always come to him with their scrapes and bruises from whatever tussle they got into. Normally, he'd heal them without any complaint, but after what his mother told him. Hey, I've got a couple of scrapes, you mind healing them? Akamine, asks as soon as they reach him. Sorry, not today guys, Izuku says apologetically. Akamine looks briefly surprised. Oh you, come on, they sting a lot and they're really nasty, he whines, look. He pulls up his sleeve to reveal scrapes and bruises that do look a bit uncomfortable, but are really not that bad. They'd heal in a week on their own. Yeah, and I got punched in the face, Furuya states bluntly, turning his head to show Izuku the bruise blooming on his cheek. The boy sighs, not even bothering to ask how he got it. I'm sorry guys, but I've kind of been using my quirk a lot for the past few days and I'm trying to take a break, he explains patiently. Yeah, but this won't take that much energy, Akumine insists, come on, man, do us a favor. Izuku shrinks under the pressure, but hey ball of irritation forms in his chest. It's his quirk, he shouldn't be pressured to use it if he doesn't want to. Actually, I'd do you guys a lot of favors, he says, slowly backing away from them, pretty much every week, really. So I think this one time you can Furuya suddenly reaches out and grabs his upper arm, pulling him back over to them. He grins down at him, but it doesn't look friendly, at all. Izuku suddenly notices how tall these older boys are, how much bigger they are than him. Even amongst boys his own age, Izuku is pretty short, so these guys practically loom over him. He gulps. Oh you, come on, Midraya kun Furuya sneers, don't be like that. He grabs Izuku's hand and puts it on his bruised cheek. To Izuku's dismay, he feels his energy begin to leave him through his fingertips and he struggles to pull away. Another thing he's noticed about his quirk is that it automatically activates when he touches an injury. He hardly ever has to think about turning it on, but it's only now that he realizes he has no idea how to turn it off. He panics when Furuya refuses to let go of his hand and Akamine starts reaching for his other arm. Hey, stop it. He snaps, I said, no. I said no. You wanna be a healer, don't you? Akamine jeers, grabbing his forearm and pulling him closer, what kind of healer refuses to heal? He starts to bring Izuku's hand towards his bruised arm, but no matter how hard Izuku pulls, he can't break out of his grip. Stop it! He cries out, his eyes welling with tears, let me go. Leave me alone. He yelps as Furuya squeezes his arm hard, and he thrashes futilely panic making his heart beat rabbit. The two boys are so much stronger than him he's never felt so helpless before. He hates it, he feels like he's going to be sick, he doesn't understand why they're doing this because he said no. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Izuku nearly cries with relief at the sound of Kakin's voice. Akamine and Furuya both pause as they look up at the blonde boy rushing out the building towards them. Izuku has never seen his friend look so angry, but the two upperclassmen don't seem intimidated. You fuckers. Kakan shrieks, get your hands off him. Izuku tries to pull away again, but Furuya doesn't let up. Or what? He laughs. Akamine snickers, yeah, what are you gonna do about it, first grader? In response, Kakan lets out a battle cry and crashes into them with explosions dancing on his palms. As soon as their grip on him is broken, Izuku turns around and flees. His heartbeat is pounding in his ears, 
but he can still hear the cacophony of explosions and yells behind him. For a second he feels a flash of worry for his friend, but he knows that he would only get in the way if he went to go help him. So, he takes cover, behind the nearest tree and waits for it to be over. For all their talk, Akamine and Furuya don't last long in this fight. Oi, oi, get off me, you're freaking crazy. Akamine shrieks. There's the sound of scuffling feet and as Yuku hesitantly peeks out from behind the tree. Kakan stands with his back to him, facing down Akamine and Furuya who are covered in multiple burns and bruises. They stare, at the blonde with wide eyes that are somehow both angry and terrified at the same time. We're gonna tell Yo-san. Furuya snaps, you'll pay for this tomorrow. Kakan merely raises his fist threateningly in response. The upperclassmen both tense up before gritting their teeth and fleeing. You're gonna regret this. Furuya shrieks before he disappears. There's a moment of silence. Then, Kakan, wipes his nose on his arm and turns around, clearly looking for Izuku. Tears blur his vision as Izuku jumps out of his hiding spot and runs over to him. Kakan. He cries out, thank you. Thank you thank you thank you Oath. He collides with Kakan and wraps him into a tight hug. He's too busy sobbing into his friend's shoulder to realize that his quirk isn't naturally responding to the cuts, and bruises that litter his skin. I I was so so scared. He hiccups, they they kept pulling on me and enforcing me to use my quirk even though I told them no. Hey, hey, what are you even saying? Kakan growls without heat, pushing him off, I can barely hear you when you're he pauses, staring down at his Yuku's forearms. Izuku looks down too and sees that his sleeves have pushed up slightly. Revealing angry red bruises forming from where Furuya and Akamine grabbed him. Oh, oh, Izuku sniffles, trying to wipe away his tears. Kakan is eerily still for a few moments, then almost quite literally explodes. I'll kill them. He screeches, whirling around as if to look for the two older boys. Kakan. Izuku yelps, pulling him back. It it's fine, it doesn't hurt that bad. Although, I I, don't think I can really heal you. He takes Kakan's hand in his and tries to pour his energy, but nothing happens. Kakan's eye twitches. Izuku lets his head hang. I'm sorry. What are you fucking apologizing for? Kakan snaps, I'm the one who's supposed to he cuts himself off, his teeth grinding audibly as he glares at the ground. They're both quiet for a few moments, Kakan silently, seething while Izuku tries to get his tears under control. He sees the other boy glancing at his bruises and is surprised to find not only anger in his eyes but guilt. Izuku blinks. You. You were really cool back there, Kakan, he says softly, I can't believe you took on two fourth graders and one. Kakan straightens up and lifts his chin. The best hero always wins. No matter what, they, always come out on top. Despite his words, his voice lacks the usual enthusiasm it usually has when he says something like that. Izuku sniffles once more before smiling. You're already my hero. Kakin's eyes widen slightly and Izuku lets out a wet chuckle. You are. You saved me, didn't you? Kakin stares at him for a few moments before his lip twitches up into a half grin. Yeah. I did. I, saved you. Izuku smiles back at him and the boy full on grins, puffing his chest up. Well, come on then, Izuku. Let's get going. Helplessness is a feeling that Izuku soon grows to hate. Inko panics when she finds out what happened later that day. She puts ice packs on Izuku and Kakan's bruises and then calls the school. Surprisingly, Kakan doesn't get in trouble for fighting again. The administration is extremely apologetic, although a part of Izuku wonders if they would have been as concerned if he were another student. He knows most of the teachers tend to like him since he's polite, doesn't cause trouble, and helps prevent kids from going home with whatever minor injuries they acquired that day. Furuya and Akamine get a harsh scolding and are suspended for a couple of days, still, the incident remains fresh in his mind for the next couple of weeks. He stays a bit closer to Kakan than before and even Tsubasa and Inaba become more protective. 
he still heals people once his bruises are gone, but he learns to limit himself and say no to smaller injuries like paper cuts. Most people are understanding, but Kakin is quick to chase off anyone who's persistent. He, almost looks like he enjoys it too, but his Yuku tries not to pay too much attention to that. Things are fine for a while. They all start to relax more as time passes. Kakin and his Yuku still basically spend all day together, but they're not as attached to the hip anymore. Like now, for example. They're back in the forest once more with Tsubasa and Inaba. Kakin has just turned 7 and decides that he wants to claim the entire forest as his territory. They usually only go a little ways in, but Kakin knocks down the perimeter fence with an explosion and leads the way. So now they're exploring deeper than they've ever gone before. Izuku is trailing a few feet behind the others, glancing around at the scenery. He's a little nervous, if only because they might get in trouble if they're caught, but he finds the trees and plants to be very pretty. It's the beginning of May so everything is in full bloom. Hey, check out that river. Kakin shouts, pointing at a shallow creek with a fallen log over it. Let's go cross it. Yeah. Tsubasa and Inaba cheer. Izuku just smiles and trails after them. The log is a bit slippery from moss, but is large enough for the boys to cross, confidently. Kakin's high-pitched voice echoes amongst the trees as he chants some song he's made up for his future hero agency, fearlessly leading his posse across the log. It's amusing until the blonde's foot slips and he falls off the log into the river. Kakin. Izuku cries already scrambling off the log and making his way down the riverbank. Hey, are you okay, man? Inabi calls down. As soon as Izuku steps into the river, Kakan re-emerges from the water and shakes his head. He looks unharmed, but Izuku still worries. Are you alright, Kakan? He asks, finally reaching him. Don't worry, Midraya-kun. Tsubasa says, you know Bakugu-kun. He's tough. Izuku grabs onto Kakin's hands and starts feeling for injuries with his quirk, but the blonde rolls his eyes and pushes him away. I'm fine, I'm fine, relax. He, complains, you think I'm gonna get hurt from falling into a little river? The greenet pouts, you could've hit your head. Come on, guys, get back up here. Inaba says. Sure. As Kakin starts back towards the shore, Clearly intending to cross the log once more, Izuku pauses, tilting his head. He heard something, just then. It sounded like a meow. But what would a cat be doing in the middle, of a forest? He's about to brush it off, but then he hears it again. This time, he looks around and pinpoints the source of the sound. Zuku, come on, hurry up. Kakin calls out. He's already climbing back up the shore. The cat meows again. It sounds distressed. Izuku's heart clenches and he knows he has to do something about it. So, he turns away from Kakin and begins climbing up the opposite, sure. Hey, where are you going? His friend questions, Zuku hey, stop. Wait up. He starts wading back through the river but Izuku doesn't wait for him. He's already at the top of the slope. Come back here. I heard something. Izuku replies, I wanna check it out. Wait up. Hey I said wait for me. Midraya-kun, what's up? Tsubasa and Inaba reach him first since they were already, halfway through the log, but Kakin is catching up. He looks irritated and stomps over to him, dripping wet. Before he can start yelling, Izuku says, I think I heard a cat. A cat? Inaba raises a brow. It sounded like it was in trouble. Izuku points to the direction where the sound came from. I think it's coming from there. I wanna check it out. Kakin scowls. Idiot. What the hell would a cat be doing here oh? Hey, there is something there. Tsubasa says. The four of them look over to see where he's pointing. A flash of silver peeks out from the distant shrubbery. Tsubasa and Inaba glance at Kakin, but Izuku is already making his way over. Kakin growls and trots after him. As they get closer, they realize that the flash of silver is really a wired fence. It looks old and is full of cobwebs, 
but that's nothing compared to what's on the other side. It's strange, seeing a place so barren and devoid of life in the middle of the blooming forest. The ground is dry and dusty and there's only a few scraggly looking trees. In the middle of the large yard is a rickety old shed, looking as if no one had been in it for years. What the hell is this place? Kakin frowns, do you think anyone lives here? Inaba asks, I think I can see a house over in that shadowy area, but it looks old. It's kind of creepy, Tsubasa admits. As he says that, Izuku hears the same meow once more. It's a lot louder now and it seems like it's coming from the shed. He perks up. Did you hear that? He asks excitedly, that was the cat. It's here. I didn't hear anything. Me, neither. But it's here, he insists, pressing his face closer to the fence. I think it's coming from that shed. The other boys are silent, sharing dubious glances between them. Then Kakin scoffs and turns around. Whatever, this is lame. Let's keep exploring. Yeah, Inuba agrees, following him. What? Izuku asks, dismayed. His friends are already walking away. But but we have to save, it. Kakan is starting to get irritated again. There's no cat there, Zuku. Now, come on. Tsubasa glances back to where he's still standing and gives him a pitying look. If someone does live there we could get in trouble for being on their property, he points out. Let's not cut our adventure short. Izuku watches them walk away, his anxiety growing with every step they take. He glances to, and fro, wondering what to do. He's not crazy, he did hear a cat. He knows it's in that dirty old shed he just knows it. Why didn't they hear it too? Why don't they believe him? The boy looks back at the strange yard and frowns. The shed doesn't look that far away. And he wouldn't be cutting their adventure short, not if he's fast. Just a few seconds, in and out, that's all he needs. There's a weak spot on the side of the fence too. He hesitates. The cat meows again, weaker this time, and his mind is made for him. Hey, Zuku. You coming or Wakakan hears metal clanging and glances over his shoulder just in time to see Zuku slipping through a weak spot in the fence. Zuku. He shrieks, spinning around and running back, what the hell are you doing? Tsubasa and Inaba panic too and, run after him. He slams into the fence and tries to force his way through the same spot as Yuku got through, but he's bigger than the other boy and it's not as easy for him to slip through. Zuku. Midraya-kun, come back. Is he crazy? Meanwhile, Izuku is still dashing across the yard as fast as he can. He can hear his friends yelling behind him, but for once he doesn't care. He's almost halfway to the shed when a sudden volley of deep barks stops him in his tracks. He looks up to see a large dog charging across the yard towards him, snarling furiously. It must have been snoozing in the shadows of one of the trees because as Yuku is certain he otherwise would have seen it the dog is massive and is charging right at him and it looks really mad and oh god what does he do what does he do? He can hear his friends telling him to run, but he can't help it he freezes in fear staring with wide eyes at the snarling dog. Panic rises in his chest and he finds his mind thinking back to the incident with the two upperclassmen, the horrible feeling of helplessness returning with a vengeance. What was he thinking? He's not like Kakan or Tsubasa or even Inuba he can't defend himself. He, can't even run away. What was he thinking running in here like that? The dog is only a few feet away from him before he manages to react. And even then he only has time to stumble back a couple of steps before the dog is upon him. Teeth flash before his eyes and he screams suddenly. The dog lets out a yelp just as two hands wrap around his Yuku's arms and he's lifted into the air. Wings flap on, either side of him and he gasps, looking down to see Kaka aiming his explosions at the dog. He snarls even more ferociously than the mutt and keeps swiping at him making the biggest explosions as Yuku has ever seen him make. The dog flinches and whirls around, quickly running away with its tail between its legs. Kakan's explosions don't stop until the dog disappears back to where it came from. And only then does he relax. Tsubasa returns a shaky as Yuku back to the ground as Inaba catches up. Midraya-kun, 
Are you okay? He asks worriedly, putting a hand on his Yuku's shoulder to steady him when he wobbles. That dog almost got you. His Yuku struggles to catch his breath as he trembles uncontrollably. The overwhelming relief has him feeling faint, as if he just healed a bunch of people all at once, but he swallows hard and nods. I I'm okay, he gasps. I adjust his words are cut off when Kakin suddenly stomps over to him and gives him a hard smack on the back of his head. He yelps, more out of shock than pain, and stares at his friend with wide eyes. Hey! Tsubasa yells, but Kakin ignores him, his red, furious eyes locked on his Yuku's. What the fuck were you thinking? He, roars, grabbing the front of his Yuku's shirt and pulling him close so he can snarl in his face. What the hell is wrong with you? Do you have a fucking death wish? You listen to me, idiot. If I tell you not to go somewhere, don't go there. And if I tell you to run, you run. Never freeze like that. Do you hear me? He roughly shakes his Yuku, who cries out and nods rapidly. What if that dog had gotten to you before I did? You can't even throw a fucking punch you would have died, is Yuku. And I the blonde cuts himself off, struggling to find his words as he sees. You I just you fucking ga. Fuck you. Before as Yuku knows it, Kakin has his arms wrapped tightly around him and is growling obscenities into his hair. Stupid. Stupid fucking idiot. Moron. You little fucking is Yuku, blinks in surprise, the fear dying down a bit. Kakin is hardly ever the one to initiate hugs. It's a bit uncomfortable he's squeezing a bit too hard and his Yuku's chin is trapped against his shoulder, but he can feel just how fast his friend's heart is beating against his chest. His eyes widen slightly. Oh. He scared him. He scared Kakin. He almost doesn't believe it at first, he never thought, Kakin could be afraid of anything. But the evidence is here, in the heartbeat he can feel thumping against his chest in the arms wrapped tightly around him as if they'll never let go. Izuku nearly cried after the dog almost attacked him, but now his eyes are watering for an entirely different reason. Ka. Kakin, he croaks, his voice muffled against the boy's shoulder. I. I'm sore hey. Guys, Tsubasa interrupts nervously, if there's a dog here then that probably means there's people too. We should go. Kakin pulls away and wipes his nose with a sniffle, but before he can say anything a high and very audible meow reaches their ears. Izuku freezes. He'd completely forgotten about the cat. Inaba perks up. Oh. I heard that. Me too, Tsubasa says a bit uneasily. His eyes, glance towards the house in the distance. Kakin meets Izuku's gaze and he must have a pleading look on his face because the blonde girds his teeth before letting out a huff. Well, we've come this fucking far, he bites out. Then, he fixes Izuku with a hard glare and leans close. But you better fucking listen to me this time. I'm going first and you're gonna stay behind me. Izuku swallows, but he's not going to argue with Kakan when he has an expression like that on his face. So he simply nods. Kakin turns and leads the way as the four boys hurry the rest of the way to the shed. The blonde cautiously opens the door before peeking his head inside. Izuku and the others wait with bated breath, watching him anxiously, but then he steps inside and waves for them to follow. Tsubasa goes first and Inaba brings up the rear, keeping Izuku between them. The inside of the shed is even more ragged and dirty than the outside. A heavy layer of dust covers everything and lingers in the air, causing Tsubasa to sneeze. Well? Kakan asks, where's the cat? I dunno. Izuku frowns, glancing around, then begins calling out, Kitty. Kitty, where are you? Idiot, it's not gonna come just because you mro? Of course. Inaba snickers, at Kakan's deadpan expression but the explosive boy just shoulders him roughly before moving towards the source of the noise. Izuku follows at his heels and peeks over his shoulder when he stops in front of a dusty, broken table. Kakin squats down and Izuku does the same, his eyes landing on a lump of fur leaning against the wall. He gasps, but it turns into a coughing fit when the dusty air hits his lungs. 
Kakin rolls his eyes at him as the other two boys join them. It's a kitten, Kakin says, I think. Are you sure? Inaba asks skeptically, it kind of just looks like a giant, free the lump of fur lets out a loud meow. Oh, nope, never mind, that's a cat. Kakin snickers and Tsubasa puts a hand on his Yuku's shoulder. Hey, you were right, Midraya kun Good job. Don't, encourage him, Kakin snaps, it was still the stupidest thing he's ever done. Once his coughing is under control, Izuku starts crawling underneath the table. As he gets closer, two pale yellow eyes appear from the mass of fur and stare at him. Even though the kitten is fairly small, Izuku still finds himself intimidated by the gaze. Be careful, Midraya kun Inaba says, it might be mean. Izuku cautiously reaches out with a hand to let the kitten sniff him. It does, and the boy smiles when its whiskers tickle his fingers. He gets the feeling that the kitten isn't too impressed with him, but he takes the chance and gently touches its belly, brushing aside its long fur. He immediately gasps. He's hurt. Izuku says, then frowns down at the wound, it looks like it got bitten by, something. Inaba tilts his head. Hey, maybe it's that dog? Maybe it chased the cat into here and trapped it. Maybe, but let's hurry up, Kakin says. I don't want to risk getting caught by whoever owns that dog. Izuku nods and turns back to the kitten, pressing his fingers to its skin and letting his energy flow. The dog bite is the most serious wound he's ever healed, but it isn't very big, since it's on a cat, so it doesn't take too much energy to heal. The kitten relaxes beneath his fingers and blinks up at him, letting out a curious meow. Come on out, little kitten, he coos, don't worry. We're nice. We're gonna take you somewhere safe. The kitten continues to stare at him, not making any move to get up. Thankfully, he doesn't make much of a fuss when Izuku just picks him up, tucking him into his arms as he clambers out from underneath the table. Oh my gosh, he whispers, he's so cute. It's dirty. Kakin wrinkles his nose. Well, yeah, cause he's been living in here for who knows how long, Izuku says readjusting his grip, let's get him out of here. The four turn to leave, but freeze when they hear Paul steps right outside the shed. The dog is back, snuffling, at the door and bumping it with its head. Izuku tenses up, but Kakin strides forward and yanks the door open, snarling as he lets out a bunch of explosions. The dog immediately yelps and runs away again and Kakin puffs up his chest, looking smug. Come on, then. They make sure the coast is clear before running back over to the fence. Turns out Kakin had blown a bigger hole in it in order to get through, so they slip through it easily and make their way back to familiar territory. They stop by the river to wash some of the dirt off the kitten, and to their surprise he actually seems to appreciate it. Hey, he is kind of cute I guess, Inuba admits, scratching behind the kitten's ear gently. The feline sneezes on him in return. He's adorable. Izuku squeals, I wanna keep him, Kakin rolls his eyes. Izuku uses his shirt to dry off the kitten and now that he's clean the boy can see that his long fur is a mottled mix of blacks and greys, with more of the latter covering his neck and chest. His paws are pretty big too, which makes Izuku wonder what breed he is. They continue trekking through the forest, the kitten sitting comfortably in Izuku's arms, and by the time they reach their neighborhood the sun is starting to set. Inka must be wondering where he is, so he and Kakin bid goodbye to Tsubasa and Inaba before heading over to his place. The soft scraping of their feet against the sidewalk is the only sound that fills the air as they walk beside each other. Izuku casts a sideways glance at Kakin. The blonde's hands are shoved deep in his pockets, jaw set and shoulders hunched as he glowers at the sidewalk beneath his feet. Somehow Izuku can tell that the scowl on his face right now is different than his normal one. Hey, Kakin? Kakin grunts. Maybe let's not tell mom about the thing with the dog? Izuku suggests sheepishly. Kakin lifts his head to glare at him silently for a moment. Then, he grumbles, only cause I'm too tired to deal with her, freaking out right now. Izuku lets out a sigh of relief, 
but his friend's not done. But don't you ever do something that stupid ever again. He snaps. I won't, is Yuku promises. I mean it, Kaken warns, that. You. You. He lets out a frustrated growl and practically spits out, you fucking scared the shit out of me back there, dumbass. I don't know if you've realized, but you might as well, be quirkless when it comes to fighting. So you leave that shit to me, alright? He huffs and turns away sharply, as if to end the conversation, but something stops Izuka from letting him do so. A flicker of irritation and frustration blooms in his chest and he can't help himself from snapping, I'm not helpless. His voice is loud, surprising both him and Kaken, who stops and turns to face him, Izuku clenches his jaw and readjusts his hold on the kitten. I. I'm not helpless, he repeats, quieter this time, I. I hate that feeling. I, I don't want to be helpless. But. But be back with Furuya-san and Akamine-san. His eyes prick and he squeezes them shut as Kaken stares at him. Th they. They were just so much stronger than me and they kept grabbing me and, and I hated it and I hated that, I couldn't do anything to stop it and, and and now this thing with the dog? The kitten in his arms shifts and rubs his face against his Yuku's chest as he clearly becomes more and more distressed. I just. He struggles to find his words. I just always thought I'd get a quirk like mom or dad's, you know? Something I could become a hero with, something I could. Be strong with. And and what I have, now is great but. But. He sniffles and rubs his eyes on his sleeve, although there's no point in trying to stop the tears from flowing. Head drooping, he mumbles miserably, I just. Kaken, I love my quirk, but I just wish it wasn't so useless. His tears drip into the kitten's fur as he sniffles pitifully. Kaken is silent for a moment, then that's fucking bullshit, Zuku. Izuku looks up in, surprise, his vision blurry from tears. Huh? He croaks. Kaken's jaw clenches and his nostrils flare as he huffs. I said that's fucking bullshit. He snaps, your quirk isn't fucking useless and you know it. It. It's fucking cool, alright? And rare as shit. You heal the dog bite in like two seconds. Yeah, it might be kind of useless in a fight, but that's why you've got me. I'll gladly kick anyone's ass for you, just name them. Izuku chuckles wetly and wipes his eyes on his shoulder sleeve. That's probably the nicest thing Kakun has ever said about his quirk, even though he sounded pissed off the entire time. He smiles sadly at his friend and says, I know. I know I can rely on you, Kakin. Of course I know that. I just. I just wish I could rely on myself too, you know? I mean, don't tell me it doesn't get annoying following me around all the time. Well, too fucking bad cause I'm telling you that, Kakin growls, trust me, I'd much rather hang out with you than those damn extras that keep tagging along with us. Kakin. He scolds lightly. Kaken snorts and gives him a contemplative look. Sniffing, he glances away and feigns nonchalance. As for relying on, yourself. Well, I suppose I can show you some moves. Izuku frowns. Moves? Yeah, you know. The blonde gestures vaguely with his hand. Teach you how to fight. I don't want my future healer to be completely useless in a battle. He arches a brow and gives him a sharp look. Not that you will be fighting, but just in case. Izuku stares at him for a few seconds as the words process, then tilts, his head. Kaken, do you even know how to fight? Kaken glares. I I mean, like, without your quirk, Izuku stammers, professionally, you know? Who cares if it's professional? What only matters is that it works, Kaken snorts. So it's decided. Izuku blinks. Eh? We'll start tomorrow after school. Eh? Without another word, Kaken turns around and continues walking down the street. Come on, Zu. I can't wait to see Auntie's face when you bring home that flabag. Izuku glances down at the kitten, who is gazing after Kaken rather judgmentally. He sighs and follows, wondering just what he got himself into. 
As he leads the way back towards Zuku's house, Katsuki hears his friend continue walking behind him. There's a brief shifting of fabric, and then a soft CO. He doesn't need to glance over his shoulder to know that Zuko must be fawning over that ugly ass cat. That ugly ass cat that he almost got his fucking face ripped off for. Katsuki's fists curl. His mind replays the encounter with the dog over and over again. The irritation and anger he felt when he'd seen Zuku slip through that fence even though he told him not to, how in a split second it morphed into cold, heart-stopping fear, as soon as he'd heard the volley of barks, as soon as he had seen the massive dog charging towards his best friend, his healer, his Zuku he'd never felt fear like that before. It was such pure, utter terror in its most unadulterated form terror because what if he didn't make it in time what if he wasn't fast enough what if he wasn't strong enough Zuko was going to get hurt Zuko was going to get killed like a horse kicked with a spiked heel the fear had spurred him into action giving him the strength and speed he needed to cross that field in a matter of seconds the icy daggers in his heart melted into a burning fury that he'd aimed at the mud for daring to attack what's his then at Zuko for being naive enough to do something so infuriatingly moronic in the first place, and now, now he aims it at himself, glaring at the ground as he quietly seethes. That was by far the stupidest thing Zuko has ever done, but Zuko is stupid and soft and Katsuki knows this because he knows everything about Zuko and he should have known he would have gone after that fucking cat. He loves animals, and he hardly ever says no to healing people and Katsuki was an absolute idiot for thinking, his friend would just forget about an animal being potentially hurt just because Katsuki told him to. Although the thought of Zuku ignoring his orders, of not listening to him and nearly getting himself killed for it, leaves a bitter taste in the back of his throat. He grits his teeth. That was way too close. And Zuku is right, of course, even though Katsuki reassured him, his quirk really is fucking useless when it comes to fighting, there's no denying that. So of course he can't have a healer that can't fight, that's an easy fix, he can teach him, but he also can't have a healer that won't listen to him that might prove to be a bit more difficult, depending on just how stupid Zuku is insisting on being, but maybe this incident will scare him straight and he'll think twice before, disobeying Katsuki again. Aren't you the cutest little thing? Zuku coos in a sickeningly sweet voice behind him, huh? Aren't you? Irritation claws at his heart and his scowl deepens. But of course it won't be that easy. Because Zuko is timid and gentle and cries easily and so unlike Katsuki in so many ways but that's alright, because where Zuku is weak, Katsuki will be strong. He can be more, than strong enough for both of them. Remnants of the fear still lingers in his chest, however, like the stubborn stench of smoke that refuses the air even after the raging wildfire has long gone. His mind unwittingly flashes back to the incident clanking metal, quick footsteps, vicious snarls, Zuku's scream, and his hands twitch, sparks threatening to pop. His chest feels tight, and he lets out, a breath he didn't know he was holding. It comes out shaky. That causes him to become even more angry with himself. Why the hell is he shaken? It was just a stupid dog and he beat it anyways. What's he so scared about? He did his damn job and he did it well. He protected Zuka from the dog, just like he protected him from those two upperclassmen assholes because he's the strongest. That mutt, didn't even touch him. He blames it on the fact it was such a close call, and that a dog is much more dangerous than two elementary school bullies. Even if he did teach him how to fight, Zuko couldn't have done anything against that thing, not without a combative quirk. He really is so weak. Which means that Katsuki needs to be better. Stronger. He can't make a mistake like that again. Zuko hates, feeling helpless? Fine. Katsuki can help him gain a little self-confidence. And in the meantime, Katsuki will continue to work to become even stronger, faster, better to protect him from any form of danger that comes their way. Kagan? Zuku's voice cuts through his thoughts and he abruptly stops. The freckled boy is standing in the middle of the walkway up to his house, gazing at him in, confusion. Katsuki had been so lost in his own mind that he had unknowingly started to walk past his house, 
Zuku tilts his head. Aren't you coming? Katsuki's eyes drop down to the kitten in his arms. Snapping jaws flash in his mind and his heart gives a little jolt. He clenches his fists. And fear? Of fucking course I'm coming. He snaps, marching towards Zuko and roughly shouldering past him, fear can go fuck itself. Chapter 3. His mother is. Surprised, to say the least, when he comes home late with a kitten in his arms. He explains that he found him in the forest, not mentioning the dog or the probably illegal trespassing. Inko listens with a look on her face saying I know where this is going, but smiles when he tells her how he healed the kitten's wounds. Finally, he gets to, asking if they can keep him and she hesitates. Please, mom. He begs, I am almost seven. I can take care of a cat. I promise I'll feed him and clean his litter box and brush his fur and. He goes on and on about all the things he'll do and to his delight he sees her expression start to soften. He gives her his best puppy dog eyes and she sighs heavily. There's a moment of silence. Then, she, admits, he is awfully cute. And as Yuku knows that he has one. Kakan is stunned. Then, he huffily grumbles, of course. The only thing he tells him before he goes home is to not name it something stupid. So, of course, Izuku decides to name the kitten Sushi, after the dinner he has that night. Kakan thinks it's stupid, but Kakan is a biased party because he never liked the cat to begin with, in the first place. And it becomes pretty clear early on that Sushi doesn't like him either. They take Sushi to the vet during the weekend and learn that he's a mix of Maine Coon and some other breed, so he's going to grow pretty big. Izuku thought, based on his current size, that perhaps Sushi was around 4 or 5 months old, but apparently he's only 2 months. Inko's eyes widen when she, hears this and she suddenly looks rather apprehensive. Thankfully, though, Sushi settles into their life fairly easily. He's fun to play with and the Midrians are more than happy to spoil him. He enjoys laying on his Yuku's desk while he does homework and claws at his pencil when he decides he needs a break. He gets along with Inko well enough, but it's clear that his Yuku is his favorite. Not that the boy is complaining. But man it's almost comical how much Sushi hates Kakin. He doesn't puff up his fur and hiss, no no, he's much more relegant than that. Whenever the blonde comes over, Sushi will plop himself right in his Yuku's lap and just glare at him judgmentally. And it is glaring. There's no other way to describe it. Inko thinks it hilarious how expressive the cat is. He can communicate, exactly what he's thinking just by looking at you. And he's never thinking anything good about Kakan, but the feeling is mutual. Izuku nearly pisses himself laughing when he walks into his room one day to find Kakan and Sushi having a glaring contest. You think you're fucking better than me, huh? Kakan growls, think staring at me will freak me out? You're just a stupid looking furball, that batted your eyes into a new family, but I've known Zuku for a hell of a lot longer than you have, so back off flabag. Behind him, Izuku is silently wheezing with laughter. He tries not to draw attention to himself, but he can't help the snort that escapes him. Kakan whirls around with wide eyes and Izuku just loses it. He bursts out with laughter as Kakan sputters indignantly and shrieks. How fucking long have you been there? Izuku's laughing so hard he can't even breathe, let alone respond. His laughter angers Kakan even more. Oh, piss off. He screeches, that cat's got a fucking attitude and you know it. Fuck knows why you keep him around. From the other room, Inko gently scolds Kakan for cursing. Despite his mirth, Izuku notices the blush on his friend's cheeks and, tries to control his laughter but he ends up just wheezing even harder. It doesn't help that Sushi is still sitting regally on his dresser, giving Kakan a smug look. Eventually, Kakan just grabs Izuku and drags him outside for another fighting lesson, which Izuku soon learns is really just an excuse to beat him up. Kakan has been staying true to his word and makes them train nearly, every day after school, although Izuku isn't sure if train is the right word. Just as he expected, Kakan doesn't really know much about actual fighting, just about roughhousing. He never really hurts his Yuku, 
but he's a rowdy boy and he's got the muscles and dirty moves to prove it. The first couple of lessons are okay, but eventually their training sessions just turn into Kakan wrestles with, Izuku for an hour and always wins. Izuku doesn't know what he expects from him. It's no secret that he's not as big or strong as Kakan or most of the other boys in his class, for that regard. Not that he's by any means a runt, he's just. On the shorter side. Always has been. Although, he supposes that these training sessions do count as him getting exercise, which is never a bad thing. Still, he's getting tired of Kakan repeatedly pinning him to the ground or grappling with him and telling him to escape. How can he escape if he's not even learning any real fighting moves? Needless to say, their lessons soon start to involve a lot more of Kakan chasing Izuku around and trying to catch him than any actual fighting moves. They have to make sure Sushi stays inside or go somewhere else to train because on more than one occasion the cat has appeared and attacked Kakan's legs while he chases Izuku. Kakan adds it to the list of reasons why he hates Sushi, but Izuku finds it endearing. He's just being protective of me, Kakan. Izuku says as he pries the cat off of his friend. It's his way of showing he loves me. Kakan's gaze lands on Sushi, who is glaring daggers at him from his spot in Izuku's arms. The blonde bears, his teeth and the cat hisses in response. It's his way of being a little shit. Izuku pouts. Over the next three years, Sushi continues to grow both in size and personality. He reigns over the Midrayu household absolutely, watching over his humans with sharp eyes, often from the top of the kitchen fridge. Izuku has woken up multiple times during the night to find those pale yellow eyes gazing at him, from amidst the darkness. It's a little creepy, he's not gonna lie, but he loves the feline enough to just accept it. What is a bit harder to accept is the strange habit that Sushi develops only a month after living with them. He starts popping up in random places where he's not supposed to be, like in the neighborhood, on top of other people's cars or roofs, and even at Izuku's school a few times. The Midrius don't understand how he does it all their windows and doors are locked when Inko leaves for work, and they don't have a cat flap, so how? It's a bit nerve-wracking at first, but they take solace in knowing that at least Sushi isn't the only outdoor cat out there. Inko suspects he likes to roam around outside because he was probably born as a stray. So, more often than not, Kakan and Izuku will find themselves joined by the fluffy cats on their way back home from school or whenever they're playing with the other kids in the neighborhood. Like now, for example. Kakan and Izuku are both 10 years old and are going to the arcade by themselves for the first time. Well, actually they're supposed to meet up with a few other kids from school there, but Andy Mitsuki, manages to convince Inko that if the boys are old enough to walk to school by themselves then they're old enough to walk to the arcade while the two mothers have a ladies day. That still doesn't stop Inko from fretting over her son before they leave, though. Okay, okay. You have enough money for tokens, right? Yes, ma'am. And and your phone is charged? Yes, ma'am. Not on silent? No, oh, make sure you mom. Is you whines, I'll be fine. Kakin's coming with me and we're gonna be hanging out with other kids the entire time. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, she apologizes, pressing a worried kiss onto her son's forehead, be safe and have fun, alright? I will. Izuku beams at her before leaving the house, quickly jogging up to Kakan who is waiting for him on the sidewalk. The blonde ruffles his hair as he approaches and Izuku giggles, playfully pushing him away. They start setting off towards the arcade, but as soon as they reach the end of the block Kakan says, we're being followed, Damas. Izuku blinks and glances around. By who? I don't see any O. When he glances over his shoulder, he sees Sushi gazing up at him from the ground. Once again, he must have followed them from the house. Izuku turns around and coos, don't worry, Sushi boy. I'll be back in a few hours, so go on back home. Sushi stares. Go on, go home. Izuku insists, but the cat doesn't move. He just keeps staring with unblinking yellow eyes. The boy pouts 
Come on, Sush, don't make me take you back myself. You really gotta train that cat better, Zhu, Kakan grumbles, giving said, feline is customary stink Kai. He listens to me sometimes. Izuku protests, but it only makes his friend snicker. Sighing in defeat, he straightens up and says, let's just keep going. He'll head on home eventually. They continue walking, and to Izuku's relief he doesn't hear the soft pitter-pattering of Sushi's paws following them. Soon, they leave their neighborhood and enter the city. The arcade is only a couple of blocks away from this point, not too long of a walk. Still, Izuku feels very grown up like strutting through the streets without an adult by his side. When he glances over his shoulder, Sushi is nowhere in sight, and he lets out a sigh of relief. He hopes the cat actually goes home instead of just wandering around the neighborhood, but that might be asking too much. For, some reason, however, he still gets the feeling that someone is watching him. The hair on the back of his neck prickles and his eyes dart around but he doesn't spot anything suspicious. Then, a familiar pink-haired boy standing by the arcade at the end of the street spots them and waves them over with a friendly smile. Izuku-kun. Katsuki-kun. Over here. Pushing the strange feeling out of his mind, Izuku instead plasters a smile on his face and jogs ahead of Kakun to greet their friend. Hey, Haru-kun. Izuku-kun. Izuku squeaks as Haru pulls him in to give him a noogie. You guys took forever to get here. Everyone's already inside. Izuku squirms out of his grasp and pouts when he has to fix his curls. Haru just grins and snickers. The other boy had joined their friend group a few months ago when he transferred into their school. He's pretty cool and extremely friendly, so of course that means that Kakan thinks he's annoying. But Izuku doesn't care. He likes hanging out with Haru, and he also brought a couple of other friends into their group that Tsubasa and Inaba quickly befriend. Plus, he has a super neat quirk called Face Shift basically he can shape shift, just only with, his face. Kakun thinks it's useless, but Izuku thinks his friend is just jealous, especially since Haru can spend hours making Izuku laugh by giving himself a duck bill or turning his hair different colors. Haru greets Kakun getting only a grunt of acknowledgement in response, and leads them into the arcade. There are no overhead lights but they can still see just fine because all the games, and booths are lit up with neon lights. It's loud and a little overwhelming, but Haru just laughs and ushers them along to where their group of friends is waiting. The next few hours are probably the most fun as Yuku has ever had. Their group goes around playing nearly every single game they see. Kakan challenges practically everyone to beat him in whatever racing games he can find and he wins, most of the time. Izuku tries to beat him and loses which while unfortunate is never a surprise when it comes to Kakan anymore, but Haru cheers him up by giving himself a lizard tongue and flicking it into his ear. Izuku squeals and runs away, Haru giving chase and pursuing him for a couple of minutes until Kakan gets annoyed and drags Izuku off to play air hockey. Turns out, he's pretty good at it. His explosive friend's face is priceless when Izuku beats him the first time and only gets more and more comical when Izuku continues to beat him two more times. Tsubasa and Haru watch from the sidelines, the latter whooping and cheering for Izuku, which only drives Kakin to fight even harder until he finally wins. Still, at the end Haru comes up to Izuku and congratulates him, Dang, Izuku-kun, you're really good at air hockey. He says, grinning. Izuku laughs and scratches the back of his head. Thanks. I never thought I'd be I've never really played it before today. Ah, so you're a natural. Haru puts an arm around him and pointedly ignores the withering glare Kakan sends him. Well, I think you deserve a prize, then. Come on, let's check out the claw machines. They. Wander over to the tall box of prizes and Izuku quickly spies a stuffed, marshmallow-shaped All Might toy. He moves to put a couple of tokens in the slot, but Haru stops him. Allow me, he says smoothly, already grabbing onto the joystick. Izuku blinks. Are you sure? Please. Haru winks. It's my treat. Which one do you want? 
he presses the start button and proceeds to expertly move the claw around, picking his way through the toys until he reaches the All Might stuffy that is Yuku points out. Izuku watches with bated breath as the claw lowers and clasps onto it, bringing it over to the drop box and releasing it without a hitch. Haru grabs the toy and hands it to Izuku with a bit of dramatics, which causes him to giggle as he accepts the gift graciously. Then the taller boy straightens, up and beams at him and something about it makes Izuku's heart feel a little funny. His cheeks grow warm and he quickly finds himself hiding his burning face behind the plushie. Thanks. He squeaks, voice muffled. They all leave soon after that to get lunch somewhere, Kakan still refuses to eat arcade food after that one bout of food poisoning during Tsubasa's 8th birthday party, and as they walk out of the building Kakan spots some TVs in a shop's window broadcasting a villain fight. Further investigation leads to the realization that it's an All Might villain fight, so naturally this sidetracks them for a while. Watch him here. Watch him here, Kakan says, I bet he's gonna bam. See, I told you he'd do that. He pumps his fists, his eyes practically sparkling as he, watches the screen. Man, it doesn't get any cooler than All Might. There's still that other one creeping up on him, though, Haru comments, just as invested as the blonde is, do you think he'll ha? Did you see that? Guy didn't even stand a chance. Izuku watches with rapt attention too, albeit behind the group of boys. He'd like to get close but he knows how excited they can get when they, watch one of All Might's fights and he doesn't, want to accidentally get in the way of any flying hands. But man, All Might is never not cool. Izuku wishes he brought his hero journal with him, despite the fact that All Might already has almost an entire notebook dedicated to just him. A flash of grey in the corner of his eye distracts him and his head whips around. Was that sushi? No, no, it couldn't be. He couldn't have possibly followed him all the way to the arcade. Just to ease his mind though, Izuku quietly sneaks away from the group to follow the flash of grey. It disappeared into a nearby alleyway, but when he reaches it the cat is nowhere in sight. The alley is dark and full of trash cans and empty crates that lean against the walls. Izuku wrinkles his nose. Sushi? He calls out, but the cat still doesn't appear. Letting out a sigh of relief, he's about to turn back and rejoin the group when one of the trash bags suddenly rustles. An empty bottle clatters to the ground. Sushi? Izuku exclaims, walking into the alley, where are you? Come on out, boy. Silence meets him. The bag rustles again. Izuku frowns. Are you stuck, buddy? He asks, jogging over to it. Don't worry, I'll as soon as he gets close, a man, suddenly lunges out from behind the trash bags and pounces on him. He immediately screams and scrambles backwards, but the man grabs him and uses his weight to force him to the ground. A hand covers his mouth muffling his yelp of pain as his back hits the gravel beneath him. Panic floods his system and he thrashes around wildly, trying to escape, but the man must have some sort of vine quirk, because the moment there's thick black vines wrapping around his body, pinning his arms to his sides and locking his legs together. He wails, but black vines quickly wrap around his mouth, gagging him. The man lets out a huff of laughter as he keeps him pinned to the ground, sneering down at him as he continues to struggle. Don't make this difficult, kid, he growls. Two vines come up to cover, Izuku's eyes, blinding him, and the terror within him escalates as his world is plunged into darkness. The man chuckles in his ear, it'll be better for both of us if you just play nice. I'd feel bad if I hurt a kid. Tears well up in Izuku's eyes as he hears a second pair of heavy footsteps approach them. Hey! Another voice says. Did you get him? Course I did. His attacker replies. Hands, grab at his Yuku and he feels himself being pulled to his feet. His legs are still bound together so he can't walk, but that doesn't seem to matter to the man as he drags him down the alley. Good, the second voice says, you sure he's the right one? There were a bunch of kids in that group of course I got the right one. The first voice snaps. 
as Yuku continues to struggle against his grasp, letting out muffled screams, until the man gives his head a hard slap. Oi, you brat. I told you to behave. To his partner, he says, don't worry, he's the one. I've been watching this kid for the past three weeks, I've seen how his quirk works. Trust me, he'll definitely be worth a pretty penny. Is Yuku's heart skips a beat at this. They want to sell him? For his quirk? How could this be, happening to him? In the back of his mind, he recalls what his mother told him the day his quirk manifested. Baby, I'm sorry, but you can't just use your quirk on anyone who asks you to, especially not strangers. There are some bad people out there that might want to take you so they can use your quirk. So this is what she was afraid of. This is why she always has Kakin following him around, he had never truly understood, he thought that she was just being overprotective or perhaps was worried about people being mean to him like Furuya and Akamine but god this is so much worse than Furuya and Akamine and this time Kakin's not here to save him. He wails again and thrashes around, slamming his head into his captor's chest. The man lets out a no if and his grip slackens, just a little, bit but it's enough for Izuku to wiggle free. Desperation fills his chest as he tries to make his escape, but it's a pathetic attempt. He's only able to turn and hop forwards once, his limbs still bound, before his second captor is upon him. Hands grab at him and pull him backwards, dragging him even further down the alleyway. They're soon joined by another pair of hands, these ones rougher and, no doubt leaving bruises. Little brat. He doesn't even know which one is speaking now, all he's aware of is the sudden explosion of pain in his head as one of the men strikes him. Fucking behave or I'll make this hell for you. Just get him in the bag. The other voice snaps, it'll be easier to bring him in then. Dazed, Izuku feels himself being pushed forward as something is pulled over his head. Fabric? No, no, he heard the man say bag they're putting him in a bag. The fabric jolts and the next thing he knows his feet are being swept off the ground. He falls onto his side, but his body doesn't hit the ground. Instead, the fabric wraps tighter around him as he gets carried in the bag, his captor's legs hitting him occasionally. Come on, now, one of the men grunts, the car's out, back. Izuku feels like he's going to be sick. The helpless feeling is worse, so much worse now. He's so pathetic, he can't even do anything, he can't even fight why did he ever think he could stand a chance on his own? He was right when he told Kakin that his quirk was useless. It was stupid of him to ever think otherwise. He wishes his friend was with him now. He'll no doubt be wondering, where is Yuko when oh god his mother's never going to find out what happened to him, he'll never see her or Kakin or any of his friends again hiss. What the foo agh. One of the men suddenly shouts. Izuku is abruptly dropped to the ground and he grunts, wondering what's going on. He can hear hissing and spitting and one of his captors is yelling, but no, wait, he's heard that hiss before, he hears it every time Kakin comes over to his house, but it can't be Ushi. He cries, his voice muffled by the black vines. What the fuck is wrong with this fucking cat? The man shrieks, get it off, get it off you know. They say cats are excellent judges of character, an entirely new voice suddenly says. Feet hit the ground with a loud thud and the vines around his Yuku disappear. He, blinks at the darkness of the bag, confused and terrified. He doesn't know what's happening, but he thinks the new person is fighting his captors, if the sounds of punching and grunting are anything to go by. Something sharp pokes at his arm and he flinches feeling a heavy but all too familiar weight settle on top of him. Tears leak out of his eyes. S sushi hi? He hiccups. A loud meow in his, ear is the response he gets and he winces as the cat starts trying to claw the bag open. It's enough to spur him into action and try to get out on his own, but his movements are slow and awkward. His head is still throbbing in pain from when one of the men struck him and he feels extremely nauseous when he pushes himself onto his hands and knees. There's not much space in the bag and the fabric, presses against his face as he straightens up, trying to figure out where the opening is. He kicks and pushes everywhere he can, 
but it must be tied shut because nothing budges. Sushi, he cries, trembling with fear, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I can't hang on, kid, the new voice says and suddenly there's hands pulling at the bag from the outside. I've almost got you. Light pierces his eyes and, he winces, blinking rapidly. As soon as he's freed from the bag, Sushi climbs onto his lap and nuzzles his face, purring loudly. He lets out a wet chuckle of relief, wrapping his arms around the feline, before he blarely looks up. A black-haired man with a scarf around his neck is crouched in front of him, staring at him with thinly veiled worry. It's obvious that he's the one who saved him, but, Izuku is dazed and shaken from the attack, so when the man reaches towards him he can't help but flinch away. The man notices and immediately retracts his hand, instead reaching into his pocket to pull out a plastic card. I'm an underground hero. The man says, showing him the card, my name's Eraserhead. It's alright, I won't hurt you, I just want to see where you're injured. Izuku blinks at, him slowly, still clutching his cat to his chest. An underground hero. A pro hero. He knows. He'd normally be freaking out right now, either asking the hero a million questions or begging him for his autograph. Probably both. But all he can do is let his eyes slide past the man to the far wall, where his two kidnappers are leaning against each other unconscious. They seem to be tied up in some sort of gray cloth. He looks to his right to see a car parked only a few feet away, its trunk wide open. The bag is on the ground next to him. Then, he looks back at Eraserhead and promptly bursts into tears. He cries harder than he's ever cried in his life, tears and snot dripping down his face as relief crashes into him. He hugs Sushi tight and just sobs into his fur, his dissipating fear and adrenaline leaving him trembling violently. Eraserhead waits patiently for him to cry himself out, putting a large hand on his shoulder in an awkward attempt at comfort. Izuka was nearly taken. He was nearly kidnapped. For his quirk. For what he gave out of generosity, people just wanted to take, to steal without any regard for him and oh god it's so much worse than any middle school bullies. Those men were watching him. If Eraserhead if he hadn't been there is Yuku is suddenly all too aware that the car is still only a few feet away. His stomach flips and he sobs even harder. Eventually, probably a solid five minutes later, Izuku finally manages to lift his head up from Sushi's now thoroughly soaked fur and croaks brokenly, th thank you. No problem, Eraserhead says, blinking down, at him, what's your name, kid, Mimadriya Izuku. He replies, slightly slurred. Did you hit your head? When Izuku nods shakily, the hero takes out a small flashlight from his utility belt and shines it into his eyes. You have a mild concussion. Are you hurting anywhere else? Izuku nods again and Eraserhead proceeds to check him head to toe, speaking softly to him the entire time. Aside from the concussion. He just has, a bunch of scrapes and bruises most of them from the vines, which, Eraserhead explains, disappeared because he used his quirk to erase the first man's quirk. Tha that's cool, Izuku murmurs, giving him a weary smile. Thanks, Eraserhead huffs, I'm gonna call the police to take these guys in. Do you have any idea why they targeted you? Um, yeah, Izuku replies, sniffling. His voice is, small and shaky as he says, my mic work. Um, they wanted me for mic work. It say it's a healing quirk and then they said they wanted to sell me, I think. He squeezes his eyes shut at the memory and hugs Sushi tighter. When he opens them again, Eraserhead's jaw is clenched. Right, he grunts. Well, sit tight, kid. Eraserhead keeps a comforting hand on his shoulder as he fishes out his phone, and calls the police. As he reports what happened, Izuku fumbles around with his own phone and is relieved to see that it isn't damaged. The light hurts his eyes but he notices the numerous text messages and missed calls that have popped up on his screen. His fingers are trembling too hard to type out a proper message, but he manages to send his location to Kaken before his phone slips from his hands. You shouldn't use your phone when you have a concussion, Eraserhead says. 
The hero sits down heavily next to him and leans against the wall. He raises an eyebrow at Sushi, who doesn't seem to mind his presence too much. Is that your cat? Is Yuku not? His name is Sushi. That seems to amuse the pro hero, who lets out a snort. He's not supposed to be out here, is Yuku adds, mostly, because he doesn't want to sit in silence, he usually only stays in our neighborhood, but he wouldn't listen to me when I told him to go home. Yeah, cats aren't exactly obedient, Eraserhead replies. He glances at the entrance of the alleyway, which is Yuku didn't realize was so far away. The villains must have dragged him farther than he thought. He's near the opposite end of the alley that opens, up to a barren parking lot, hence the car. The car that he almost got trapped in. The car that almost took him away from his life forever. Izuku sniffles again and tightens his grip on Sushi. Where are your parents? The underground hero asks, pulling him out of his thoughts, are they nearby? No, no, I was with Zuku. Eraserhead tenses up as Kakan appears at the entrance of the alley, panting heavily. His crimson eyes land on the man and he bares his teeth, charging forward. Who the hell are you? He snarls, explosions popping in his palms, get away from him. Kakan, wait! Is Yuku cries. Eraserhead stands up and intercepts the blonde before he can reach them. His scarf flares around him and his eyes flash red causing the explosions to disappear. Kakin only manages to look, down at his hands and surprise before the scarf wraps around him, binding him tightly. What the hell? Kakin screeches, thrashing around, get off me. I'll kill you. Kakin. Izuku yells more insistently. The loud noises are killing his head, but he ignores it for now. Stop. He's a pro hero. You know this kid? Eraserhead asks sounding a bit unimpressed. Izuku confirms and he sighs, loosening his grip slightly. Relax, kid, I'm not gonna hurt your friend here. He was just attacked by a couple of villains and I took them down. He turned slightly so Kakin can see the unconscious men still tied together. Kakin's eyes narrow before he squirms out of his scarf. Zuku. He runs over to Izuku and kneels down in front of him, grabbing his shoulders lightly. Are you alright? What, the hell happened? And what the fuck is Sushi doing here? Sushi, who is still curled up against Izuku's chest, hisses and tries to swipe at Kakin, but the boy dodges. I. I. Izuku stutters, they. The pain in his head is making it hard for him to talk and he kind of just wants to take a nap, but he forces his eyes to stay open. Thankfully, Eraserhead explains for him. Those guys were trying, to kidnap him and sell him off, he states bluntly. Kakin's eyes widen and he whips his head to look at him. Eraserhead continues, healing quirks are rare and considered valuable, so I know that. Kakin snaps. Eraserhead's eye twitches but Kakin just turns back to his Yuku, hands flexing like he doesn't know what to do with them. Shit, Zuku, are you? His eyes roam over him, from his bruised arms and face to his glazed eyes. His jaw clenches. Shit. 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 Shit if you could call his parents that would be helpful, Eraserhead interrupts. Kakin surprisingly does so without much fuss. Izuku cringes at the police sirens as they get closer. His head feels like it's about to explode and he's even more tired now. He can hear Kakin on the phone with his mother, who, is no doubt freaking out. Eraserhead helps him to his feet and leads him to one of the police cars, ushering Kakin in as well before turning to help some officers put the two villains into another car. He's not coming with us? Kakin asks as the officer in front starts driving away. Heroes don't usually accompany victims to the police station, kid, the officer replies, he has to stay, behind to give his report and then he'll probably just continue his patrol. Right. I knew that. Kakin grumbles under his breath. He glances at his Yuku, who is idly petting Sushi with drooping eyelids as he leans against his shoulder. Hey, stay awake. His Yuku whines but obliges. The drive to the police station is fairly quick and soon as Yuku is being examined by a nurse, who confirms that he has, 
a mild concussion. Kakin has to hold Sushi the whole time, which neither of them are happy about. He shifts in his seat impatiently while she cleans and bandages his Yuku's scrapes, telling him to take it easy for the next few days to give his brain time to heal. Thankfully, it's summer break, so at least he won't have to take time off of school. Then, a police officer comes in and asks him a bunch, of questions, helping him file a report which he writes down on his clipboard. Kakin stays silent the entire time, only occasionally growling at a particular detail or grumbling when Sushi digs his claws into his lap. Once the report is complete, the officer hands it off to someone else before waiting with them for their parents to arrive. Ten minutes later, Inko bursts in with Auntie Mitsuki, and Uncle Maseru at her heels. She's already a blubbering mess, but when she sees Izuku's bruised face she cries even harder. Oh, my baby. She sobs, hugging him tightly, my baby, my poor baby. Glad to see you're okay, kiddo, Auntie Mitsuki says, then turns to Kakin with a scowl on her face, and where the hell were you? Hey, I thought he was with me the whole time. Kakin snaps, I didn't even realize they'd taken him until guys, please, the officer interrupts, raising her hands, lower your voices. Midraya-san has a concussion and yelling isn't going to make him feel better. Inko whimpers and buries her face into her son's hair. Sushi, who made the mistake of climbing back into his Yuku's lap while they were waiting, meows in distress as he's squished between them, Sushi? Inko hiccups, pulling away slightly. WH what are you doing here? Izuku smiles tiredly and snuggles him closer. He tried to fight off the bad guys, he says, a hint of pride in his voice. Inko looks confused. Uncle Masaru turns to the police officer and asks, please, can you tell us exactly what happened? We only got a vague idea from Katsuki. Did someone really try to kidnap Izuku? The officer nods and repeats what was reported by both Izuku and Eraserhead. Inka looks like she's about to faint when she hears that the villains wanted to sell Izuku for his quirk. Auntie Mitsuki growls and Uncle Masaru tenses up, casting a worried look toward the boy. When the officer is done, she informs Inko of Izuku's injuries and tells her that he will need to take it easy for the next few days and get lots of rest. Inko nods hastily and thanks the officer before helping her son into the car. She was still with Auntie Mitsuki when she got the call from Kakin, so the woman drove her and Uncle Masaru to the station in her car. It's a bit of a squeeze with five people and a cat, but they make it back home with relative ease. When they get out of the car, Kakin, who was silent the entire ride, asks Inko if he and his Yuku can have a sleepover. Oh, of of course. Inko says, I'll put the futon in Izuku's room. Just remember that he needs a lot of rest and no video games. They're bad for his concussion. It's fine, Kakin replies, I just want to. He trails off, eyeing Izuku before glancing away with gritted teeth. Inko smiles understandingly and nods. Do you mind if, Masaru and I come over for a bit? Auntie Mitsuki asks, I can help you cook dinner. And... You look like you could use some company. Thank you, Inko sighs. So they all enter the Midraya household, Inko helping Izuku to the couch like he's made of glass. Kakin and Sushi settle in beside him while the adults move to the kitchen. There's not much to do since he's not allowed to watch TV, but, he's too tired to do that anyway so he just lets his head drop onto his friend's shoulder. After a moment. Kakin wraps his arm around Izuku and pulls him closer, resting his chin on top of his curls. Izuku lets out a soft sigh, closing his eyes and listening to his friend breathe. He can hear the adults in the kitchen and Inko's muffled cries. His mother is obviously trying to keep her voice low, as she speaks with Auntie Mitsuki and Uncle Masaru in hushed tones, but her sniffling and occasional whimpers are as clear as day. His heart aches for her he knows how badly this must have shaken her. But right now, he's too tired to even consider consoling her. So, with his head on Kakin's shoulder and his cat curled up against him, Izuku drifts off to sleep. If some fucker comes along and decides to snatch Izuku-kun because he wants to force him to use his quirk, what are you gonna do? I'll beat him up, 
Of course. I'll beat up any fucker who tries to take him. Katsuki is Zuku's protector. He knows this. It's been this way for over half their lives now, and not once has he complained about it. The role comes as naturally to him as the explosions in his palms do. Those guys were trying to kidnap him and sell him off. His arm tightens around Zuku's sleeping form. But this time someone else had to save him. Someone else had to be his protector. Someone else had to do Katsuki's damn job for him. And fuck, if they hadn't, Zuko would be anti Inko's soft cries from the kitchen reach his ears, interrupting his thoughts. He can hear his mother's voice, gentler than he's ever heard, trying to soothe her as she, struggles to muffle her sobs. His chest suddenly feels too tight. He knows that if he looks down he'll see the numerous scrapes and bruises from the villains littering Zuku's skin. And where the hell were you? And where the hell were you? And where the hell were you? Zuku lets out a soft whimper. Katsuki immediately loosens his hold around him. Having unconsciously tightened his arm into a, vice grip. Zuku relaxes against him once more, but the burning, self-loathing anger remains. There's something else to it, though. He's used to anger. There's not a day that passes in which he doesn't 